on today's episode of Mile Higher. Today, we are yet again joined by Graham Hancock. How is archaeology any different than, say, medicine, you know, other types of sciences? And it shouldn't be monopolized by a relatively tiny group of professionals who have a much too high opinion of themselves. Do you worry if a cataclysm happens now, a lot of what we have discovered and built as a civilization will be lost? For all of these is that they have inherited a shared idea and are manifesting that idea in different periods of history and different cultures in slightly different ways. But the idea is what is ancient. It seems like a lot of people are waking up to that idea. Do you have hope in the younger generation? Is it possible that some of them survived? Is there descendants of that civilization still around today? When I said in the series that I'm public enemy number one to archaeologists, well, that actually is what I am. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 258. And today we are yet again joined by Graham Hancock. If you didn't catch our last episode, we dove into a variety of topics just yes, now. Yes, we did indeed. But we're back again to talk about even more. Yes, I'm very excited for this episode because we're going to be diving into really your your forte, your specialty, and that yeah. is this question of was there a lost advanced civilization that existed at the end of the ice age and also are we a species with amnesia are we missing a piece of human prehistory yeah and this mystery has driven you for the past what 30 years or so yes uh, it, it it really it really has since the since the late 1980s in fact since since about 1989 all my work was was journalism before that and and my books the I did write books in that period but they were either 70s the 1970s and the 1980s they were some travel books and some current affairs uh, books uh looking for example at at um the Ethiopian famine in 1984 that book was called Ethiopia the challenge of hunger uh looking at uh, the corruption in the international aid business. I wrote a book called Lords of Poverty. Hmm. The subtitle was The Freewheeling Lifestyles, Power, Prestige, and Corruption of the Multi-Billion Dollar Aid Business. Wow. And I was looking at foreign aid as an institution. And uh, in those days, you know, criticizing foreign aid was like criticizing motherhood. You know, it Hmm. was something you just weren't supposed to do. But I had seen so much of, so much going wrong with aid in my in my travels particularly around africa that i felt somebody needed to speak out about it it's not that i had anything against individual aid workers but aid as an institution uh was not help it, i found it i found it was very unhelpful mm. uh, to so-called developing countries and i felt this needed to be to be pointed out but around about that same time uh traveling widely and traveling in particular in in ethiopia I came across Ethiopia's claim to possess the lost Ark of the Covenant, um, and uh, I found it uh, a very interesting Absolutely. claim, since no other country in the world claims to possess that uh, that relic. Um, and uh, I began to look into it, uh, look into it in in depth, uh, and that was what led me ultimately into this investigation into the possibility of a lost civilization of the of, of the ice age uh, the, the the book that I wrote about the Ark of the Covenant was called the sign and the seal quest for the lost Ark of the Covenant it was published in 1992 but there were certain aspects of the of the Ark of the Covenant uh, as it's as it's described in ancient texts and as Ethiopians still talk about it today uh, which didn't seem to fit the context of the times it, it it seemed it seemed like some sort of technological device of some of some kind um that it's very carefully described in the book of exodus its dimensions are are given precisely uh, it's a wooden box but it's lined outside and inside with gold with with pure gold and then supposedly the tablets of stone with the ten commandments are placed inside it but it does all kinds of weird stuff it it lifts its bearers up into the air. It's carried on carrying poles by a group of bearers. Sometimes it will it will kill them. Sometimes a oh, bolt wow. of fire will 
flash out from it. Uh, it doesn't seem to depend on the on, on, on whether the person is is negative or or, or positive. There there was a, a character called Uza in the Bible. There was a, one occasion when the ark was being carried on the back of a a cart and it seemed to be unsteady. And he reached out to steady it, and a bolt of fire lashed out from it, it and struck him dead. Even though his intentions were, were were perfectly good, it seemed like it seemed to have a hint of technology about it. Not not simply you know superstitions about dis- the divine power, but but something something that didn't quite make sense in the context. And this this led me to the to consider the possibility that that there might be something missing in our story. That that we we shouldn't rule out the possibility of perhaps other kinds of technology, not necessarily our kind of technology, being developed by some civilization in the ancient past. And this is. Um, was one of the reasons why I then went on to write Fingerprints of the Gods, which was published in 1995, uh, and which is probably probably my my best known book in in this area. That's where I really went in depth into investigating the possibility of a lost civilization of the Ice Age. And obviously, as the years have gone by, um, I've I've refined my thinking on this and and learned a lot as as I've gone along. And I, I'd like to make this clear at the outset when talking about a lost, advanced civilization, is I don't mean a civilization like ours, uh, like flying cars, and, no, and, and, and robots and, and, and robots and 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 all our stuff. I don't I don't mean that at all. I believe that all human civilizations have emerged out of shamanism. I think shamanism is the fundamental basis uh, of human civilization. And it's the fundamental basis of knowledge. And shamanism uh, can be very scientific uh, in, its, in its pursuits and it, in its investigations. And I think that's the, that's the basement, that's the foundation of, of all human cultures. And some human cultures have taken that foundation and gone in one direction, and some have gone in other directions. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm often criticized for saying that some kind of weird advanced civilization came out came and taught indigenous people stuff no that's not what it's about that advanced so-called advanced civilization emerged out of shamanism itself mm-hmm. um and and it was an indigenous civilization um and and i believe it was it was it was present uh, all all over the world but it it began for me with a series of problems and questions uh, about the about the past and about the way that the the past is explained and uh, amongst those issues, two in particular stand out for me. One is um, evidence of extraordinarily advanced knowledge of the cosmos uh, and, and, and of the Earth's place in the solar system uh, at, a very, at a very early date, just about as early as you can go uh, when you look at ancient texts like the Rig Veda in India, for example. Uh, There is evidence long before the Greeks, who are credited with being the first discoverers of a phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes, there is evidence that cultures long before that, going back into the mists of time, in the oldest myths and traditions that we know, are encoded a series of numbers and a certain symbolism, which is often the symbolism of a great mill turning in the heavens. Um, And and in in fact, uh, I, I like to recommend books by by other authors, and and the, the book that I recommend, and and the book that was key in my own journey, was written by two professors of the history of science back in the nineteen sixties, or perhaps sixty nine nineteen seventy. Their names were were Giorgio de Santillana, who was a professor of the history of science at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Hertha von Deschend, who was professor of the history of science at Frankfurt University, and they. It's a monumental work of research and investigation. And they, they demonstrated completely, at any rate to my satisfaction, uh, nobody has ever really successfully faulted them on this, that there was a highly sophisticated knowledge of the precession of the equinoxes, that it's impossible to trace how far back it goes. It just goes back thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of years. And they attribute it to some, what they call some almost unbelievable ancestor civilization that first came to understand the world in, in terms of number and measure. Um, and, and, I mean, to cut a long story short, precession is an observed phenomenon. 
uh, at the moment, if you take the north pole of the Earth, the, the axis of the Earth, and you extend the north pole up into the heavens, uh, you will find that that is pointing at a particular star, pretty much, and that star is called Polaris, and that's our pole star mm. uh, in in our time. But it hasn't always been the pole star, and it won't always be the pole star uh, because there's a wobble on the axis of the Earth, and therefore that extended north pole is actually transcribing a great circle in the heavens. And sometimes it will point at empty space, and sometimes it will point at a, at another star. There have been a number of stars in the past that have been pole stars. Thuban in Draco was a pole star about 4,000 years ago. Um, at the same time, um, and this is where, where it uh, edges into what we now call astrology, um, there are the, the 12 constellations of the, of the zodiac. And uh, why are they recognized as such? Because, because they are, they are uh, the constellations against the background of which the sun rises um, according to a very definite schedule. And the, the, the greatest interest in ancient times was what constellation houses the sun on the spring equinox? What constellation is rising behind the sun. The sun is seen to be in the grip of that constellation at dawn on the spring equinox. And in our time, that is the constellation of Pisces. And we live in the age of Pisces. Mm -hmm. uh, within a lifetime or two, it will have shifted uh, into the constellation of Aquarius. And we do live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius at, at, at dawn on the spring equinox. Before Pisces, it was Aries. Before Aries, it was Taurus. And uh, you can go back and back and back and back and back. And whether it's to do with the pole star or whether it's to do with the constellation that houses the sun at dawn on the spring equinox, these changes are all called, caused by that wobble on the axis of the Earth. It's our viewing platform from which we observe the stars as it changes its orientation in the heavens. Naturally, the, the orientation and the rising times of particular stars will change. It's thought that the Greeks, perhaps as, as, as recently as, as less than 200 BC, you know, 2,200 years ago or so, were the discoverers of precession. Uh, but what uh, Santillana and von Deschend uh, absolutely demonstrated is that they were simply rediscovering or redeploying much older knowledge. Now, it takes a long time to observe this. You have to be very precise to observe this. It unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. The whole cycle takes 25,920 years to complete. Um, and, and to observe it precisely and predict it accurately and know exactly what's going on, and then to create a symbol for it, a great mill turning in the heavens, and to use that symbol and to combine it with numbers that are referenced in myths and traditions all around the world, they detected uh, the fingerprints of an ancient science in that, which had largely been forgotten, but the key elements of it were remembered through great storytelling, through myths, through traditions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and through the notion of world ages. Um, and, and this uh, is definitely the work of something that we would need to recognize as a, as a civilization with, with scientific uh, focus. And that, does, that is a civilization that can and did arise out of shamanism. Shamans are very observant of the cosmos and of what is going on in the cosmos. Second thing is the existence of ancient maps which show the world as it looked during the last ice age. We know pretty well how the world looked during the last ice age. And what is the big change? The big change is that during the ice age, uh, sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. Uh, that means that huge amounts of land that were above water during the Ice Age are now underwater. Um, and, and therefore, it's odd to find maps which were drawn in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, but where the map makers tell us that they were using much older source maps that were falling apart, that they were trying to preserve the information in those maps, copied them onto their new maps, and lo and behold, they show the world as it looked during the last Ice Age. They show Antarctica uh, in maps uh, drawn in the 1500s based on older source maps when our civilization didn't even know Antarctica existed until 1820. But there it is in all its glory on these much more ancient maps. And then another problem, uh, many of these maps, particularly the, the, the so-called Portolanos, which are all copies of older source maps but often incorporate 
new knowledge that was that was discovered at the time that the map makers were were working uh, that these contain extremely accurate relative longitudes and longitude is a scientific issue which our civilization didn't crack until the middle of the 18th century uh, in fact there was a huge prize a, a, an unbelievable prize i believe it was a million million british pounds that was offered wow. for anybody who could crack the longitude problem well longitude is really important if you're a sailor if you're if you're navigating at sea because you know if you don't know your longitude you might be 300 miles east or west of where you think you are right and you might crash into a coastline that you're not expecting it's really useful to know exactly what your longitude is uh, but it took a very accurate uh, chronometer that would keep accurate time at sea despite the rolling motion of the ship uh, before our civilization was able to solve the problem of longitude and solve the longitude problem roughly in the 1750s onwards is when is when is when we solved it and yet here are these ancient maps with extremely accurate relative longitudes long before we solved it and those maps themselves are based on even older source maps so these curiosities led me led me to think that it's worth exploring the possibility that our historians and archaeologists don't know everything about the past that there might be new things to learn about the past that there might be a forgotten episode in the human story as virtually every one of the great myths and traditions around the world um, insists on uh, and and that set me on my journey to to explore to explore this possibility that and while i was researching the previous book the sign and the seal uh, finding myself in the presence of the great pyramid of egypt uh, which is which is uh, just the most unbelievable staggering extraordinary work of beauty and art and science the great the great pyramid is an incredibly complicated monument but those who those who built it had an enormous knowledge uh, which they which they manifested in the great pyramid and I, i'll i'll tell you a bit more about that as we go along yeah god i'm just, so for those that don't understand what is mainstream academia's view on those maps you just referenced like why don't they see the same thing that you do Oh, um, they think it's just fantasies of the map makers. Um, they're just they're just like having fun, take a best crack at what it yeah, looks like, and just make yeah. stuff up. You know, make up Antarctica, for yeah. example. Just just make it up. <laughs> why? Why though? That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> well, they say that the that those map makers had the idea that the Earth somehow needed to be balanced. Oh, so there's got to be land at the bottom, yeah. land at the top. Yeah, and in fact, even though there actually isn't much land around the North Pole, it's right. mostly sea right. ice. Yeah. Whereas Antarctica is a true continent, huge continent, yeah, yeah. which is which is buried under un, under ice. Um, so you, you you know I I I mean they're welcome to their view, but I don't agree with it. I think I think we're looking at hints and clues that something is missing in our story, and and I made it my focus for for many many years to try and identify what that missing thing could be. Uh, and and to 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 try to show that uh, that archaeology, most archaeologists would deny this, and I, I know lots of individual archaeologists who I like very much. But again, as was the case with my with my book critiquing foreign aid, I'm looking at archaeology as an institution which has a particular which has a particular narrative uh, to to tell, um, and and uh, whether they like it or not, the the, the narrative of the institution of archaeology is that archaeology is the sole arbiter and the sole voice that has a right to speak authoritatively about our past uh, and that we should basically accept everything that archaeologists say. This is why some archaeologists were so annoyed with me about my Netflix series, uh, <laughs> Ancient Apocalypse, yeah. Yeah. because you know, I wasn't repeating their narrative. Yeah, I was. I was telling a different story and saying, "Look into, look into different possibilities." Um, and and um, I couldn't do anything that I do without the work that archaeologists have done. And I want to pay tribute to archaeologists for that. They do a lot of hard, gritty work, very, very important work. But like any profession, any science that that gets committed to a particular paradigm. It's very difficult to see outside the boundaries of that paradigm. So I was astonished, even though I kind of expected it. I was astonished when the Society for American Archaeologists, egged on by a couple of very furious archaeologists, one of whom has been stalking my work for, for 30 years, I was surprised when the Society for American Archaeologists wrote an open letter to Netflix 
uh, demanding that my documentary series be reclassified as science fiction and saying that archaeology already knew for an absolute fact that there was no possibility of a lost civilization during the Ice Age. And I don't understand how they could know that. I just don't, I don't get it. It's actually a lie. They don't know it for an absolute fact. It's important to realize a number of things about archaeology. A lot of archaeology that gets done doesn't get done because of a targeted search for something specific. It may be, particularly in the industrialized technological societies, it may be because a dam is being built or a new highway is being built. And rightly and properly, before that land is, is overturned and, and destroyed to create the new dam or the new highway, uh, they want to find out if there's anything of archaeological interest in there. So they'll call in archaeologists, and archaeologists will check the landscape out and look and do some digging. And, and uh, if they find anything of archaeological interest, uh, they will report it and publish it in peer-reviewed journals and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that leaves huge areas of, of, of even yeah. the industrialized technological societies which have never been studied by archaeologists at all. Never, never looked at for a moment because there's not been the funding or the reason to look there. They haven't, they, they, they haven't had the justification in their minds mm. to spend scarce funds on looking, on looking there. And the other thing is that, that there are large, very large areas of the world uh, that archaeology has barely looked at at all. Uh, I'm not saying that no archaeology has been done in these areas, but the Sahara Desert, for example, is largely underserved by archaeology. It's not that no archaeology has been done, but minimal very minimal archaeology has been done in an area that covers 9 million square kilometers. Okay, And we know for sure from paleoclimatology, the study of ancient climates, that the Sahara Desert went through a number of phases of being green and fertile during the Ice Age. As a matter of fact, some of those um, ancient maps that I've talked about show a green and fertile mm -hmm. Sahara. And they show river channels running through it where we now know that river channels did run through the Sahara. Um, so it was an area at one time, particularly during the Ice Age, when, when the Northern Hemisphere was extremely unpleasant in many ways and, and frozen and dry and inhospitable, it would be natural to migrate to warmer areas, especially if they were fertile. And the Sahara Desert, several episodes during and after the Ice Age, was a very fertile place. So it seems to me quite a serious omission to say that we know everything, we know so much that we can absolutely rule out the possibility of a lost civilization of the Ice Age, but, you know, we haven't looked very much at the Sahara Desert. Likewise, the Amazon rainforest. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, largely for economic reasons, this is an area that has, uh, that has been underserved by archaeology. There's been very little study uh, of the Amazon. Not none, important to make that point, but not much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you, you know, you have 5 million plus square kilometers of the Amazon rainforest, uh, covered by, still covered by dense canopy, uh, which has hardly seen any archeological attention at all. Um, and, and yet the latest investigations in the Amazon, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I have nothing against individual archeologists. There's some great archeologists who are beginning to dip their toes in the water of doing the real research in the Amazon. And I'm in touch with a team who are doing LIDAR work in the Amazon, where, where, where they use the light aircraft to send beams of light down through the canopy, and they can see what's lying underneath the canopy. And they're fi finding these giant geometrical earthworks uh, in the Amazon, and evidence of, of very large populations that once, that once lived in the Amazon before the, the, the horrendous catastrophe of the Spanish conquest uh, of, of uh, South America and, and, and of Mexico. The, the Spanish sent ahead of them terrible diseases like smallpox. Uh, and, and those populations which did exist in the Amazon, the Amazon supported millions of people. Uh, those populations were decimated, destroyed by smallpox. And within a hundred years, their cities were overgrown by rainforest. And it's over now, only now, that they're being, that they're being rediscovered. So how can archaeology say, we know enough about the past to be absolutely certain that there was no lost civilization when they haven't really studied the Sahara Desert and they haven't really studied the Amazon rainforest. And then, in addition to that, huge issue is that sea level rise at the end of the last ice age. That 400-foot sea level, it didn't happen overnight. It was spread out over, over thousands of years, but there were episodes of very rapid sea level rise, very sudden and rapid sea level rise, which are, which are mysterious in themselves. 
the bottom line is that, that 27 million square kilometers of land, and that was the best land on Earth during the Ice Age, that was above water during the Ice Age, is underwater now. And yes, there is some marine archaeology. Yes, archaeologists are beginning to consider the possibility that it's worth looking at the flooded continental shelves. Some preliminary work has been done, but most marine archaeology has been about shipwrecks from the medieval period. They're looking for oh. shipwrecks because they don't believe that there's anything really that's going to change their view of the past. So their preconception of what might be found has, has governed what they actually do. And again, of course, financial reasons. It's very expensive to, to explore underwater. So there we have 9 million square kilometers in the Sahara Desert, 5 million plus square kilometers still left in the Amazon. It was bigger, 7 plus yeah. million square kilometers. Um, and, 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 and 27 million square kilometers of the flooded continental shelves. And then we have the fact that the archaeology that has been done elsewhere has largely been in response to roads and dams and other big construction projects and not targeted searches. So they simply cannot say that they have enough evidence to rule out the possibility of a lost civilization. And, and to say that is, I just call a thing what it is. It's a lie. It's not yeah. true. Life is expensive and these days it's so easy to get yourself into debt. And once you're in debt, it's always a pain to get out of debt. So how many of you out there wish there was a better solution to paying off your debt? Well, PDS Debt has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. With rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all-time high, now's the time to finally take initiative with your debt. Stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PDS Debt. PDS Debt is giving our qualified listeners a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30-second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash mh. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. For me personally, when I got out of the college, I was dealing with tons of credit card debt and I was just making minimum payments just to pay that interest and I wasn't getting anywhere. So I actually used a program much like PDS Debt to roll all my payments into a low interest monthly payment and I was able to get out of debt completely in a matter of a year or so. And that's exactly what PDS Debt offers. They offer a program to help you get all of your debt and balances down in a much, much more feasible way. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest payment and everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies and there's no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit is accepted, which is always great to hear. Save thousands in interest and fees and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time like I did. PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment. Again, at www.pdsdebt.com slash mh. That's P-D-S-D-E-B-T dot com slash mh. Take back your financial freedom today by visiting pdsdebt.com slash mh. Can we go back a little bit to the rainforest? Yeah. I really think it would be so interesting to our audience to hear mm -hmm. a little bit more about the possibility that there were these giant cities yeah. in the Amazon. Yeah that they were as big as London, multiple yeah, of them. absolutely. And yeah. how they kept all of these people fed was yeah. through this soil called terra, terra Prater. Prater. Yeah, yeah terra I found Prater, that Black fascinating. Earth. Can you explain that? One of the problems with hosting large populations in a rainforest right. is, is, that, is that rainforests are actually, despite their exuberance, are, are not particularly fertile soils. The, the fertility of the soil is caused by the fall of leaves and the decaying of vegetation um, but but if you if you remove the trees within a relatively short time the soil will become will become infertile mm. um, terra preta sometimes known as the black earth is a man-made soil human beings invented it and the earliest so far found but remember so little study has been done in the Amazon. Yeah. so we don't the even early, know for sure say again we don't know for sure then if this hasn't been around previously we don't know but what we do know is it's been around at least nine thousand years um and and uh, i believe it's been around a lot longer a lot longer than that people found a way to make the amazon productive by for, for human beings in two ways first of all by inventing this soil which is still sought after today yeah. by anybody seeking to settle and, and create agriculture in the amazon if they can find patches of terra preta uh, they're going to be able to grow anything they need to grow. It's it it, it it's self-replicating soil. It's full of bacteria and 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 organisms that create its fertility, and it's quite a miracle uh, of 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 human creation. And that is a scientific work of the Amazonian peoples, and it's at least nine thousand years old. Um, and and 
goodness knows what what else remains to be remains to be discovered there. So that's the that's the the, the first point. The second point about the Amazon is that and a lot of people don't realize this, is that the Amazon itself is a man-made ecosystem. It is uh, designed to serve the interests of human beings. Uh, if you look at what are called the hyperdominant trees in the Amazon, they're all trees that produce foods that are needed by human beings. And other trees that are not useful to human beings are, are much less present in the Amazon. So the whole thing was created to serve humanity. Uh, and and human beings who lived in balance with their with their ecosystem, up until the time of the Spanish conquest, um, and 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 um, again, this is this is a science, like all sciences everywhere. That ultimately, if you trace it back far enough, you're going to find it emerged out of shamanism and about shamanistic curiosity about the nature of reality and the nature of the universe. We talked in the last episode about ayahuasca, right? Right. A very powerful visionary brew. Um, ayahuasca is also a work of science that was the creation of the indigenous peoples of the Amazon, who I think we must recognize as a civilization mm -hmm. in every possible way. If not advanced, I mean, that uh, seems pretty uh, advanced. To I think a brew. we need to recognize them as an advanced civilization. We just need to redefine what we describe as advanced. Yeah, in some I think way. that's where people are you know lost. advanced isn't necessarily motor cars and airplanes yeah. and, and plastic. There's lots of ways to be advanced. And and in the case in the case of the Amazon ayahuasca, highly effective visionary brew, uh, is only may is only possible. It's it's important to. For, for, for viewers to understand this, that the, the dimethyltryptamine DMT, probably the most powerful psych psychedelic known to science, um, is not normally orally accessible. Uh, that's why people smoke it or or, or, or vape it. Um, but what they found in the Amazon was a way to make it orally accessible, and that's because the the, the leaves of the chacruna plant contain DMT, pure DMT. Uh, but you can't have a trip if you consume or drink a tea made from those leaves because of an enzyme in the gut called monoamine oxidase, which switches off DMT on contact. So therefore, you need a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Now, this is a scientific pursuit. Right, yeah. You need a monoamine oxidase inhibitor in the brew, which is going to shut down that enzyme in the gut and allow the DMT to be absorbed orally. And that's what they found. That's what they discovered in the Amazon God knows how Who long. Who knows ago. how long? That's thousands crazy. and thousands of years ago, for sure. Wow, thousands of years ago, and and it's an extraordinary achievement when you consider the the hundred thousand plus different species of plants and trees that exist in the Amazon. Um, to do that solely by trial and error, you know, to put together the most powerful hallucinogen known to science. I don't like that word. The most powerful psychedelic known to science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to put it together with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor in I have to admit, a foul-tasting brew, um, and, and, and enable visions to take place, which in Amazonian society, in indigenous society, are seen as valuable information. We've been taught to trivialize visionary experiences and regard them as some kind of nonsense. Uh, but all those archaeologists who think that I attack indigenous, indigenous societies in some way, which I never do, I have the highest respect for, for, for indigenous cultures, um, they're they're not recognizing the the science that that is present in those cultures, the advanced nature of the science. The discovery of ayahuasca uh, is an extraordinary achievement in itself, and then the the realization that ayahuasca has useful teachings to bring to us, which Western science dismisses entirely, but which is fundamental to Amazonian civilization, is the second most important thing. So they 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 create a brew, and that brew allows us to gain access to knowledge that would not otherwise be available to us. Sometimes quite practical knowledge. Shamans will, will use the altered state of consciousness to identify where particular game animals that they wish to hunt uh, are, to, are congregating. They will, leave, they will leave their body, oh, wow. go up into the astral and look down on this plane. And then they'll come back and report, that's where you need to go to, to, to hunt. So it's used for practical purposes as well as, as, well as for spiritual purposes. Um, so the question of the cities, um, there was a Spanish traveler um, who, de Carvajal, who crossed the entire width of South America in the 1540s, mm. some years after 
the conquest of Peru had begun, and a little longer after the conquest of Mexico. He didn't do it as an exploration. It wasn't his intention to explore. He was with 20 other guys, and their intention was to go hunting for a day um, and to bring back uh, food for, for their, the rest of their team. They went off in a launch, a small boat on the Amazon River, and the Amazon wouldn't let them go back. Mm. It just carried them ever eastwards until after a year, they finally came out in the Atlantic Ocean. They started off on the Pacific side, and they came out in wow. the Atlantic Ocean. And on the way, yes, uh, he reported seeing huge cities, sophisticated with advanced arts and crafts, um, highly populated. Within a hundred years, other Spaniards were in there exploring. They couldn't find the cities. So they said, oh, he must have made it all up. And that's what academia continued to say until the LIDAR work began to be done in the Amazon, which revealed that, in fact, those cities, those huge habitations, often joined by straight roadways that run for 100 kilometers or more from one settlement to the other, did exist in the Amazon. Why weren't they found 100 years after the Carvajal? They weren't found because they, they smallpox had utterly destroyed their populations. And once those populations were gone, they weren't able to keep the rainforest at bay, and it consumed those cities, and they're only, they're only being found now. Uh, so there's a whole hidden history of humanity awaiting us in the Amazon. I'm very glad that some teams of archaeologists are now beginning to do really exciting work uh, in the Amazon, and I'm closely in contact with those teams, and I think that, that we're going to get a whole new vision of the past of humanity from the work that they're doing. Well, and just the fact that there's still uncontacted tribes there. There's still uncontacted mm -hmm. tribes, yeah. Mm -hmm. That are that's, living. That's absolutely right. The Amazon and the Amazon is the last preserve uh, that has that has not really been completely corrupted by Western industrial civilization. Um, and uh, you know, they 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 don't want our stuff. No, they don't want anything to do with us. Uh, they know. Uh, I, I, I've, I've talked to shamans in the Amazon about this, and, and they, they see the doom of mankind in the behavior of Western technological civilizations now. And when I say Western, I'm, I'm, I'm including Russia and China as well. These are all technological, following the technological yeah. model where tech is the answer to everything. Right. You know, and it's all about production and, 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 and consumption and no connection to spirit. They, they, they see that as, as the, the slippery slope that will lead us on the on the road to on the road to ruin, um, and so you know we have we have much to learn from Amazonian civilization and from the lost past of humanity that is hidden in the Amazon and that is only now beginning to be revealed. Or already one phenomenon are these are these huge geometrical enclosures that are being found in the Amazon. They're earthworks. Now, I don't know if you've been to England. Or, or not, but we have. in England we have um, famously Stonehenge, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a number of other henges. Avebury Henge is a particularly beautiful one. Uh, actually, the word henge means it, it means an earthwork. Um, the, it, when stone circles are erected inside it, it becomes something a bit more complicated. It's got the big megaliths inside it, and there are those in some of the Amazon cases as well. But those huge geometrical earthworks are almost indistinguishable from the henges uh, that you find in, in, in Europe and particularly in Britain. Now, I am not saying that people from Britain thousands of years ago went Brought to the that, Amazon yeah. right. and taught them how to build henges. Of and I'm not, not saying that people from the Amazon went to Britain and taught the Brits how to build henges either. I'm saying that both seem to have been in receipt of a common idea handed down from, to quote Santillana and Von Deschen, some almost unbelievable ancestor civilization of remote antiquity. Um, and and uh, therefore, it's fascinating to see these, these enclosures in the Amazon, these earthworks on a very large scale. One of them called Tequinho uh, is clearly a geometrical exercise on a huge scale to, to square the circle, something that, that, that geometers have long been interested in. You have a circular earthwork, surrounded by a square earthwork that touches it at four points around the circle. Um, you have uh, enormous enclosures that are perfectly aligned to true north, south, east, and west. That tells you that astronomers were at work in the creation of those, of those enclosures. And in some cases, they go back very far. In those found thus far go back at least as far as 3,000, maybe more than 3,000 years ago, 
But I want to know what else is going to be found in that 5 million square kilometers that hasn't been investigated yet at all. We're just touching the edge of a huge mystery in the Amazon. And interestingly, the geometrical enclosures that have, that have been identified thus far, particularly in the state of Acre in Brazil, contain in their design uh, some connections to ayahuasca visions, which are off, also full of geometry, uh, and to a particular notion of the Tucano people of the entrance to the other world, which is a geometrical enclosure, uh, and which looks just like some of these enclosures that are on the ground today. So we're seeing science in the form of the creation of these huge geometrically geometrical, perfectly oriented structures, and we're seeing it connected to spirituality as well. So this is why you say it's the origins are shamanistic. Like the, I believe the origins is... of all civilization are shamanistic, and once and once that and once that origin is there, then it's up to different different cultures to choose which route they take, which way which way they go. Mm. Um, and and um, I I think that we are that we are dealing with a lost civilization that was shamanistic in its basis and that pursued a route that was capable of doing all the accurate detailed measurement over hundreds of years to work out precession of the equinoxes and work out what was causing it and to and to regard that information as so important that they encoded it in incredible stories and and traditions that were then passed down through the generations those number systems keep on cropping up again and again and again and again and the key number is 72 as one degree of precession as hold your finger up to the horizon and one degree of precession is the width of your finger wow. against the horizon. Hard to observe in one lifetime. You need multiple lifetimes. You need people watching and keeping records for long periods of time mm -hmm. in order to get this nailed and understand and understand what is what is what is happening there. So that's why you don't because like your critics will say, well, all these civilizations all did it on their own. Yeah. That they, you know, this idea that there was this older, advanced civilization that taught everybody how to do stuff is is absolutely ridiculous. They did it all on that's your what own. That's what they. That's what my critics say. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. It's they like, think that I'm trying to that I'm trying to steal the achievements of indigenous mm. societies yeah, and yeah. hand them and hand them over Discredit to some sort of civilization them. like ours. Yeah. Right. No, right. that's not what I'm doing. That's a misrepresentation of my position. And anybody I know who actually reads shame. my books. You know, or watches the series, will see that that is not what I'm saying, and that's that that's that's not what I'm doing. I I I think we're looking at a civilization that emerged out of shamanism and took a particular route, and of course, it was an indigenous civilization in its own time, in its own place. Mm -hmm. But uh, what they don't like is the notion that that certain knowledge and information accumulated by that culture was passed down all around the world, uh, so that you find the same essential ideas. In Mesopotamia, right. in ancient Egypt, uh, in the Amazon rainforest, in Mexico, in Guatemala, amongst the Mayan culture, for example, the same essential ideas are being repeated. The same, the same story of a great flood, which brought a former age of the world right. to an end. Um, the same story of survivors of that flood who went around the world trying to reincarnate or give rebirth to to what they had they had created and shared their knowledge uh, with with other peoples around the world this is truly a pan american myth it's found it's found right across the americas and archaeologists are now trying to claim that that myth was entirely made up by spaniards but it's mm. complete rubbish it long predated the spaniards and and it's found in in many many countries in central america south america and in north america uh, and it's an indigenous tradition that has been passed down through the ages, that there was a cataclysm. It's not just coincidence, Graham, right? I don't believe it's coincidence. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I believe that it's worth considering the possibility of a remote common ancestor, which passed down key information that was inherited by later cultures and then used in, in various ways. An example that's really worth giving is, is the Great Pyramid itself, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, which we don't know how old it is. Like we, I'm, Egypt I'm, wi I'm willing to accept that the that the Great Pyramid, in the form that we see it now, was was largely completed by the ancient Egyptians. But remember that the in in dynastic times, in other words, between five thousand and four thousand years ago, roughly four thousand five hundred years ago. But remember that the ancient Egyptians tell us in many of their texts that everything they knew 
was a legacy. It was all an inheritance of the gods. And right. I don't construe the gods as aliens. <laughs> it, was a, it, it, it was a legacy of the gods. And they speak of a time called Zeptepi, the first time, uh, which followed a cataclysmic episode when the gods brought this knowledge to, to Egypt and, and passed it down. Now, um, in the case of the Great Pyramid and the whole Giza Plateau, I think if we were to, this is my view, and, and it's based on a great deal of research, which is entirely dismissed by, by archaeologists. Whenever they dismiss my work, they don't really get to grips with the work itself. They just, it, it's just a narrative they don't want to hear. Right. Uh, so, so they dismiss it. But if I, were to, if I were to try to envisage the Giza Plateau 12 and a half thousand years ago, I think what we'd see is an enormous rock-hewn statue of a lion facing due east, perfectly due east, where the sun rises on the spring equinox. Sun rises perfectly due east on, in the Northern Hemisphere on the 21st of March. Uh, if you go to the summer solstice, it's rising far to the north of east. If you go to the winter solstice, it's rising far to the south of east. But on the spring equinox, it's perfectly due east. So there's this huge lion statue with a massive leonine head and, and a lion's mane and it's been created by carving it out of the bedrock and creating a trench around it. And it faces the rising sun at dawn on the spring equinox, as it still does today. But 12 and a half thousand years ago, the rising sun at dawn on the spring equinox was housed by the constellation of Leo, the mm. constellation that we recognize and many cultures have recognized as a lion. So as above, so below, this lion monument gazing at its celestial counterpart, rising behind the sun at dawn on the, on the spring equinox. I believe that the megalithic temples that we see in front of the Great Sphinx, the so-called Sphinx Temple and the Vali Temple, these are colossal megalithic works, were also there at that time, around 12 and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and what happened was that in later times, the ancient Egyptians, who were the inheritors of the culture that originally established the Giza Plateau, that the ancient Egyptians found it necessary to restore and modify some very ancient monuments. So that's why on the Vali Temple, uh, which is in front of, but a little to the south of the Great Sphinx, that's why on the Vali Temple, we see that it's created in two stages. The first stage is the core limestone blocks, and they are massive, hundreds of tons in some cases, certainly up to 200 tons in, in the case of some of these megalithic temples on the Giza Plateau. Um, but the limestone is heavily eroded. And then in dynastic times, they took the trouble to bring granite to the Giza Plateau and then to cut that granite so that it fitted the existing erosion patterns on the much older limestone blocks. Mm -hmm and fit it onto them there. That shows two things. It shows, first of all, that they, that they respected the limestone blocks. And secondly, it shows that the granite facing is younger than the limestone blocks itself. Um, and, and there is nothing, not a single inscription uh, in those temples which, which says this was built by Pharaoh such and such and such and such. And such. Yeah. Um, I, I think that where the three great pyramids stand, the pyramids that are now attributed to Khufu, Khafre, and right. Kara, yeah. Uh, I think what, what, what stood there at that time were, were, were low platforms, megalithic platforms. In the case of the Great Pyramid, they didn't need to do much because the Great Pyramid itself is built around a natural hillock. Um, and and uh, deep underneath it, 100 feet vertically beneath the base of the Great Pyramid is a, is a chamber, subterranean chamber, hewn out of solid bedrock. I think that was the original sacred site on the Giza Plateau. And, and the Great Pyramid, uh, originally a platform, uh, was completed in the time of the ancient Egyptians using knowledge that was passed down from that much more ancient time. Now, why it operated in two phases like this? You know, in, in, in ancient cultures that, that took the heavens seriously and that understood the notion of world ages, 12 and a half thousand years ago was a very dramatic time on our planet. This was the 12,800 years ago was the onset of the Younger Dryas, which is a, a, a catastrophic climate episode. Uh, which is where, where, where the earth has been emerging quite slowly and almost pleasantly from the ice age and then suddenly goes back into a dramatic deep freeze. And weirdly, at the same time, there's, a, there's an almost instant sea level rise recorded, for example, in Bahamian corals, which can only exist at a certain depth beneath the surface of the sea. Um, and that's odd. 
because because this is a time when the world's climate has suddenly gone very cold. It was warming up and then it goes as cold as it was at the peak of the last ice age. You wouldn't expect to see sea level rise happening then. But the work of Cesare Emilia, Emiliani has proved that sea level rise did occur then. Um, then you have about 1,200 years of true horror on this planet. That's the time that all the great megafauna of the ice age go extinct. We're all familiar with the saber-toothed tigers, the, mm -hmm. the woolly rhinos, the mammoths, the mastodons, the giant sloths. They were everywhere then, but they were all they all went extinct during the Younger Dryas. So clearly, this was a very bad time if it could wipe out just huge numbers of, of animal species that were very successful species prior to that. There's evidence of a, of a collapse in human populations at that time. It was a very bad time. And it may have been, I believe that's the time uh, where we lost track of an episode in our story, where we, where we lost track of an earlier civilization that uh, not our civilization, not like us, we should never look for ourselves yeah. in the past, but a, but a civilization that was capable of exploring and navigating the earth that understood the dimensions of the earth uh, and, and that understood how the earth looked and was there capable of creating accurate maps with accurate longitudes. Incorporated into the Great Pyramid uh, are the dimensions of our planet. Um, and again, yes, Egyptologists know that this is the case, but they regard it as a coincidence. It just happened by accident. Yeah. But uh, it's a point that I, 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 I like to bring home. And, and, and this is that if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. And if you take the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid, measure that, and multiply it by the same number, 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. So the key dimensions of our planet are encoded on a scale of 1 to 43,200 in the Great Pyramid. And to tell us that it's speaking to the Earth, it's also almost perfectly aligned to true north within three sixtieths of a single degree. Yeah. I mean, that is a tiny, tiny error on a monument that weighs six million tons and has a footprint of yeah. 13 acres, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's speaking to the earth and it encodes the dimensions of the earth. But archaeologists say, what's so special about 43,200? <laughs> it's just random. You know? <laughs> but no, I'm sorry, it's not random. It's 600 times 72. It's one of those numbers generated by the precession of the equinoxes. 43,200 is a number that occurs in many ancient texts and traditions, or 432,000 multiples of the, same, of the same number keep on coming up again and again and again. And that is a number system that is generated by a key motion of the Earth itself. So how clever can you get? Yeah. You have a gigantic monument which nobody understands how anybody could build it in the first right. place you almost perfectly align it to true north. You then encode the dimensions of the earth in that monument, and the scale you used is a scale defined by a key motion yeah. of the earth yeah. itself. I mean, come on. Yeah. This cannot be an accident. It seems so obvious. We're, we're looking at science here. Mm -hmm. we, are looking, we are looking at an ancient lost science that the ancient Egyptians were the inheritors of, as they themselves loudly and frequently proclaimed. It's just that archaeologists don't want them to say that. Yeah, it's interesting with the king, king lists in yeah. ancient Egypt. Uh, there are king lists all over the temples. For example, the temple of Seti I in Abydos. Um, lists of kings. And actually, Egyptologists use those king lists in formulating their chronology of ancient Egypt. And they're fine with the king lists as long as they go back only to the first dynasty. But the problem is the king lists go back further. They go back more than 30,000 years into the past. Those archaeologists ignore and dismiss as myth and fantasy. And again, they claim they're the ones with respect for indigenous cultures. They're yeah. not respecting the indigenous culture of ancient Egypt with the knowledge that it manifested. They said our kings were not confined to the first dynasty onwards. There were, there were rulers went back thousands and tens of thousands of years before that. We should listen carefully to, to all of these things. I think that's what's so frustrating about it too, is that they come from this place of we're just trying to respect these ancient cultures, but they're really dismissing them. They're very dismissive, especially of them. to say that all of this is just coincidence. Yeah, yeah. you know, it I mean, you ask isn't. you ask what are these mainstream archaeologists? They say they respect indigenous cultures. Ask them if they respect shamanistic views uh, 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 about the other world, about the world we enter in a deeply altered state of consciousness, about how we can encounter the spirits of deceased relatives in that world. Archaeologists mm. will say, no, no, that's impossible. Yeah, it can't be. That's just their 
fantasy. That's just the story yeah. they tell themselves. Stories. Archaeologists don't know that. That's their prejudice. They are being prejudiced against indigenous cultures in that world. And they're subtly in their subconscious, they know they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And they're wearing their guilt at the way that they put down indigenous cultures. And then they want to project it onto other people. Yes, that's, that's the exactly game right. Play. It seems like everything you do in the digital world, whether it's apps or streaming services, involves you signing up for a subscription. And it's very easy to lose track of all of those subscriptions. And most of the time we sign up for subscriptions for, you know, to watch a specific show or use a specific product. But after so long, we, you know, just stop using it or using those services and we forget that we're paying for those subscriptions. I know for me personally, I probably am subscribed to 10 to 20 different services. And I would say probably like half of those I don't even use anymore. And I didn't even know I was still paying for most of those until I hooked myself up with Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. It's over 80% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about, and chances are you're one of them. Like that Stars app just to watch one show or that free gaming trial you never actually used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you and for any you don't want to pay for anymore, just hit cancel, which is so nice. That's like one of the biggest things I don't go and cancel them on my own is it's just a big pain in the butt, but Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. Rocket Money also helps you manage all of your finances in one place and automatically categorizes your expenses. So you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. They've got credit monitoring. They monitor your credit card usage. It really is a great, great tool to help you get organized when it comes to your personal finances. Over 3 million people, including myself, have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash milehire. That's rocketmoney.com slash milehire. Check it out today, rocketmoney.com slash milehire. I mean, it's just crazy. We've talked about, you know, alternative theories to how it was, how the pyramids were built. Yeah. And those out there in that field get all up in arms about it. Or, or if you say, it wasn't the ancient Egyptian people that mm. that built it, or you know, didn't do it in this certain way. Or they that, brought knowledge from somewhere else, or, yeah, right? You right. know, access something. Yeah, or that there's gets technology it. that they access. That gets everybody very upset. Yeah. The the reasons that that I would never seek to divorce the ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramids are are there are several reasons actually, but uh, but but first and foremost. I, I have I have no doubt that the ancient Egyptians were involved in completing the Great Pyramids, and there's four reasons for that. And that is the shafts, the so-called air shafts, that cut through the body of the Great Pyramid. Uh, they're very small. Um, they're about that wide and that high. There are two of them in the so-called King's Chamber, yeah. one on the north wall, one on the south wall. Mm -hmm. And they always exited on the outside of the pyramid, and that was known back into the, into the 19th century. You know, 19th century explorers could actually climb the Great Pyramid and roll a cannonball into one of those shafts, and it would end up in the king's chamber. So right. obviously, they were they were they were connected. The shafts in the so-called queen's chamber, and I use the word so-called because we actually don't know what these chambers were for. No, no burial of any pharaoh was ever found inside the Great Pyramid. Um, the so-called queen's chamber, the shafts don't exit on the outside of the Great Pyramid, uh, and nor until 1872 were they visible within the queen's chamber itself. They'd been closed off with little, with facing blocks. The, you, you couldn't see that they were there. But, but one researcher went around tapping on the walls. He thought there's shafts upstairs in the king's chamber. Maybe there are here. And he found two hollow points, one on the north wall, one on the south wall, broke them open, and lo and behold, there were the concealed shafts. Now the thing about those shafts is that all four of them point at key stars, one of them being the lowest of the three stars of Orion's belt in the position in the sky that they occupied around 2,500 BC, not 12 and a half thousand years ago, but four and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and, and that astronomical connection to the stars at that time says to me, we cannot divorce the ancient Egyptians from the Great Pyramid. Uh, but then there's a problem. The ground pattern on the three pyramids on the ground reflects the pattern of Orion's of Orion, belt itself. Yeah. And this is, of course, no accident within the ancient Egyptian system. Uh, because the constellation of Orion was seen as the celestial image of the god Osiris, mm -hmm. the civilization bringer, uh, the, 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 the entity who went around the world teaching civilization. 
he is that that is who Osiris is, and he is he is seen in the sky. His image is seen in the sky as the constellation of of Orion, and one of those shafts points at uh, at, at Orion's belt, and another one points at at Sirius, and two of them point at the circumpolar stars. Uh, at the time uh, when Egyptologists believe the pyramids were built, so there's definitely a connection, and I wouldn't and I wouldn't seek to to to, to break it, but. Um, the problem is that the pattern of the three pyramids on the ground is the pattern of the three stars of the belt of Orion. And this has also changed subtly over the ages as a result of precession. So although the shafts in the Great Pyramid lock that monument to the epoch of 2500 BC, the pattern of the pyramids on the ground reflecting Orion's belt Effectively, it's like you want to make a painting of Orion's belt. You paint it on an easel, and then you lay it down flat in front of you. That's what you have on the Giza Plateau. They reflect the pattern of Orion's belt and its relationship to the Milky Way. The Great Pyramids and their relationship to the River Nile reflect the sky of 12,500 years ago, not 4,500 years ago. A very complicated situation here. Ground pattern, speaking of what the ancient Egyptians called Zeptepi the first time, 12,500 plus years ago. And the star shafts connecting also to the time of the ancient Egyptians themselves. So no wonder it's a difficult, it's a difficult monument to figure out, but it speaks to both epochs. Um, and and uh, as I say, <clears throat> we could say that the, 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 the ancient Egyptians themselves had a sufficiently advanced knowledge of procession to be able to visualize the skies uh, of 8,000 years previously. Uh, That would be a perfectly reasonable thing to say. But uh, then we're confronted with the problem of the Sphinx. I mentioned that lion-bodied monument, uh, that that lion monument that I believe stood there 12,500 years ago, looking at the rising sun when it was housed by the constellation of Leo. That lion monument has been subjected to thousands of years of erosion. Um, And I want to pay tribute to the brilliant work of two individuals. The late, great John Anthony West, dear friend of mine, the first to raise the possibility that the Great Sphinx had been subjected to some kind of water weathering, and that creates a problem in itself, because 4,500 years ago, the uh, Giza Plateau was as dry uh, and as waterless as as it is today. And then Professor Robert Schock from Boston University, Mm. and kudos to Robert Schock for putting his reputation as an established academic on the line and looking at the geology of that site, and coming to the conclusion, and publishing the conclusion, uh, that the Great Sphinx was subjected to about 1,000 years of extremely heavy rainfall. Not a flood, but precipitation, rainfall coming from above, selectively hollowing out the softer areas of rock and leaving the harder areas of rock in in, in place. And it's that precipitation-induced weathering that you see more in the trench around the Great Sphinx now than you see on the Sphinx itself, because the Sphinx has been constantly restored. This is one of the anomalies. We know that some of the restoration blocks were put there in the time of the pharaoh who's supposed to have been responsible for the Sphinx, and not a single document tells us that he was responsible. That's just another Egyptological fantasy, actually. Um, the, the, the erosion patterns on the Great Sphinx, and thank you to Robert Schock for the great work he's done on this, and, and the risks he took, in publishing that work, because every time you publish it, you publish something out of line, you're taking a risk. But he took that risk, and he published that work, and he's documented it thoroughly, and he's confident that the Great Sphinx was subjected to about a thousand years of heavy rainfall, and that's the only time you find that heavy rainfall on the Giza Plateau is the Younger Dryas, between roughly 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. You certainly didn't find it 4,500 years ago when the Sphinx is supposed to have been made. So we're looking at a very old monument, very heavily eroded in the time of the ancient Egyptians. They looked at that massive Leonine head, which was so damaged and so eroded, almost unrecognizable, and they recarved what was left of it uh, into the head of a human being, wearing the Nemes headdress of an Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, But that that is a recarving of a much more ancient monument. That's, That's a restoration work. That was done on it, and we don't know who, which pharaoh it's supposed to represent. Egyptologists like to think that it represents Khafre, but there's no, there's no compelling evidence for that what, what's, whatsoever. So a lion-bodied monument, a, once a lion-headed monument, that now takes the form of the lion-bodied Great Sphinx with a recarved human head that's way out of proportion 
to the scale of the rest of the body of that 270 foot long uh, monument. The head is sort of tiny by comparison with the rest right. of the body. And the ancient yeah. Egyptians didn't get things out of proportion mm-hmm. unless there was a very good reason to do so. And I think they were restoring a, a very damaged and much older Leonine head. Is there not a hidden chamber as well under the Sphinx? Yes. Um, while work was allowed to be done, John Anthony West and Robert Schock were both involved in this work back in 1992. Uh, they did um, a seismic survey around the Sphinx, and they identified a very large uh, geometrical chamber about 15 feet uh, beneath the forepaws of the Sphinx. Wow. You know, 20 feet beneath the forepaws. Could be a natural cavity, but the geometrical, the rectangular form of it suggests strongly that human beings were Was involved. dug out or something. Yeah, yeah. That, it was, that it was made. And, and, and in fact, there is a whole underworld at Giza, this is beginning to be recognized. The so-called Tomb of Osiris is an example of this. That subterranean chamber beneath the Great Pyramid is an example of this. There's, I think there's a lot more remains to be discovered under the Giza Plateau. Yeah. Have they lidar the it. Giza Plateau? Well, lidar in that, in that case wouldn't help um, because, because there's, no, there's no canopy covering it. Nothing you need to see oh, through. I see. Yeah, but what, what right. is needed is, is, is seismic tomography. Right. Um, and and, and uh, that, will show you, that will show you a picture of what is of what is underneath the Giza plateau, and whatever that's been done, it's identified chambers, passageways, corridors, um, and not enough is being said about this. And I don't know what's going on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't think. You don't think I don't like think that grander... Egyptologists are in a conspiracy to hide the truth. I think they're just so locked into their paradigm that they they can't see what's they feel like they fi- they've got it figured out they've got they it figured no, out no reason and to waste resources exactly no reason to waste resources and they don't want to get mixed up in any way with this crowd of kind of quote unquote new age thinkers like graham hankel <laughs> right mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so have you because there's this idea about this chamber beneath the sphinx yeah being potentially this hall of records yes yeah. And that was put forth by Edgar Casey, I believe. Through it was, which channels. is one of the reasons that Egyptologists gets, yeah. distance themselves from it. Although weirdly, both Mark Lehner, which he's got a lot of knowledge around this subject, mm. uh, Edgar Casey, and well, first of all, first of all, the fact that Edgar Casey, Edgar Casey was a healer. He used to fall into a trance-like state. And in that trance-like state, primarily what he did was offer remedies for people's ailments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but from time to time, he would start talking about Atlantis and about a lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity. Um, and he said that the Hall of Records of Atlantis lay beneath the paws of the, of the Great Sphinx. Well, immediately for, for, for scientifically minded Egyptologists, this is something to get as far away from as possible. Right. Like this <laughs> nutty guy. Yeah. So they kind of neglect the fact that there are ancient Egyptian texts that speak precisely of that, precisely of a hall of records. I don't know. Ed Casey didn't know about those texts. Right. That's he was tapping in, from, tapping in from some other realm mm-hmm. uh, in, into this. But that's one of the reasons that Egyptologists have distanced themselves so much from the, uh, you, you know, from, from the notion that there might be something hidden there. Oddly enough, both Mark Lehner, who is the leading American Egyptologist um, doing work around the Great Sphinx and on the Giza Plateau, and Zahi Hawass, who's the leading Egyptian Egyptologist doing work around the Giza Plateau, both of them were sent through college by the Edgar Casey Foundation. Really? Mm. Wow. Robert Baval and I published this in our 1996 book, the Message of the Sphinx. It was published in, in America as The Message of the Sphinx and in Britain as Keeper of Genesis. And we documented it. It's all there if anybody wants to check it out. Wow. Uh, very rapidly afterwards, they distanced themselves completely yeah. from the Edgar Casey organization. But until quite recently, Zahir Was was still giving lectures at the Edgar Casey Foundation, while at the same time <laughs> insisting that he had nothing to do with any of these so-called crazy ideas. That's crazy. You know, wow. it's, it's, a very, it's a very curious thing. And and um, of course, people have a right to change their mind. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Perhaps that's perhaps that's all that all that happened. Um, as I say, I don't I don't see a need for conspiracy when 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 there's already this mindset that just rules out any other possibilities. That is the mindset of institutional archaeology, not necessarily shared by all individual archaeologists, but it is the narrative they want to tell. And and what I've observed, particularly. <laughs> In the re- uh, the reaction to to my Netflix series, which was seen by huge numbers of people all around the world, is that what most disturbed archaeologists about it was that here was a narrative that wasn't theirs. 
they weren't controlling that narrative anymore. They thought they had it taped and they were controlling the narrative in every possible way. And suddenly reaching out to a huge audience around the world comes somebody they didn't like anyway. Right. Me. They wish it was one of them. That was, I think that. so. Yeah. Or, 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 or rather more than that, they want to remain the high priests of the past. They don't, I, I certainly don't want to be the high priest of the past. Uh, all I want, all I want to do is to point out that there are certain problems in mainstream study of the past, which need, which require questioning and investigation. And, and the questions I've asked and the conclusion I've come to is that we are a species with amnesia, that there was a forgotten, there has been a forgotten episode in the human story and that its fingerprints are in fact all around the world, but are, are not seen uh, because it doesn't fit the prevailing mainstream narrative. Now, those archaeologists were furiously angry with me because you know I had this huge platform, um, mm -hmm. Netflix, to present my ideas on, and, and that's why they they campaigned to have Netflix, you know, relabel the series of science, it's not a documentary, science fiction. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what they the archaeologists were it's telling were, stories on here. <laughs> that's what archaeologists were claiming. You know, um, they they wanted to get back control of the narrative, but. Uh, one thing that has to be remembered is that archaeology has an iron death grip on the narrative of our past. The fact that I had a Netflix series and Netflix is a big platform doesn't begin to compare with the fact that the findings, the conclusions, the narrative of mainstream archaeology informs everything that we are taught through the school and education right. system right up yeah. to university about the past. Everything we're taught about prehistory reflects the narrative of mainstream archaeology. So against that huge weight, and also most TV programs about, whether it's about ancient Egypt or other, other prehistoric subjects, are again informed by the, the institution of archaeology and reflect the narrative of archaeology. So just by dissenting from that and, and offering an alternative point of view, let's think about things a bit differently. Let's consider whether archaeology really does know everything it claims to know. That led to an enormous amount of fury and anger uh, projected, projected against me. But what it also led to uh, was a worldwide conversation that many, many people who hadn't been exposed to my work were exposed to my work. And uh, I want to make clear that, first of all, I couldn't do anything I do without the work that archaeologists have done, the groundwork that archaeologists have done. And secondly, I'm not alone. There are a number of other people working in this field. John Anthony West was one. Robert Schock was another. Robert Boval huge, huge knowledge of, of archaeoastronomy. Um, John Major Jenkins dealing with the, with, with the Mayan calendar. Many others, uh, John Major Jenkins has sadly passed away. Uh, ma many others are working in this field. I'm just, one, I'm just one of a number of people who are bothered by problems in the past and are trying to find answers to that problem. And some people find, think that the answer is, is extraterrestrial visitors. <laughs> I don't think that's the answer, but yeah. who knows, you know? Well, they have a whole show too. So yeah, they have the a whole they that? have a whole show too. That's you know that's not my thing, but but um, I think what's right and proper uh, is to be mystified by the past and the things that aren't properly explained by 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 the mainstream model, and I think that that model needs to be challenged. And this is how, ultimately, in all of science, paradigms do eventually shift. There, there's a there, there's a great. Uh, a great book by Thomas Kuhn called the, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which which shows that that actually um, scientific disciplines get locked in a particular mindset, and they and it becomes dominant, and it's regarded they forget that it's a whole load of opinion in that mindset mm -hmm. resting on relatively flimsy facts. That's definitely mm. the case in archaeology, as I as I indicated earlier. I mean, you can't claim to know everything about the past when you haven't thoroughly archaeologized the Sahara the Amazon rainforest, the flooded continental shelves, and most of the work that you do in other countries is in response to a dam or a road being built. You know, you can't, you can't claim to, to know about that. And, in, and just to be clear for those that maybe haven't watched Ancient Apocalypse yet, yeah, you are really, I mean, you're a journalist, you're an investigative journalist, you don't claim to be a scientist, you don't claim no. to be an archaeologist, and you're, what you're really doing is you're, you're out there gathering puzzle yeah. pieces and trying to put a puzzle yeah. together. And that's that's like, and then share what you're finding yeah. in the process. Yeah. Encouraging people to think 
fights. That's what I, that's what I that's what I hope to do. And 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 I've never insisted that I'm right. Yeah, you're like yeah. rewrite the history, but you you propose that <laughs> yeah. maybe we don't have it right, but you're yeah. not saying this is the no, right way. Absolutely, absolutely not. I'm not I'm not insisting on anything. The only thing I'm insisting on is that there are unexplained issues in our past, right, which are presently not explained by the system that teaches us about the past, which is archaeology. Um, and and those those unexplained mysteries need to be investigated, and I've tried to investigate it. I've come to my own conclusions about them, but I don't insist that I'm right. I certainly don't insist that I'm a hundred percent right about anything. Um, but I've I've involved myself in an inquiry which has now gone on for more than thirty years. I've put my life on the line again and again. Not only me, but also my wife Santa. You know, this is not some trivial issue for us. Mm -hmm. This is not some you know, some scheme to make money. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, for, for many years, I was completely broke. And all the research we did was done on borrowed money to the point, to the point where I, I was just ridiculously over, over borrowed. Uh, and we have put ourselves, we have put our lives at risk in the, in the, in the diving expeditions. For example, Santa nearly lost her life in, in, in one of those diving expeditions. Really? I, and, yes, I and another one. When you're diving in strong currents, uh, when something goes wrong with your air supply, it can be very, yeah. very dangerous and very, yes. very difficult. And we, I think Santa and I did upwards of a thousand dives all around wow. the world, 200 of them in Japan on the extraordinary underwater structures that are found off the, off the island of Yonaguni. Uh, we've been into high risk zones. Uh, we've, we've literally again and again put, a, put our lives on the line to try to research this story properly. You know, I'm not some dilettante and just some shallow uh, person yeah. who is just looking at stuff and coming rapidly to conclusions. A keyboard right. warrior or something I'm, like I'm not a keyboard warrior. <laughs> I'm trying to force those conclusions on the public. The conclusions that I've come to are, are a result of decades of, of dedicated work, uh, which, has, which has exposed both me and Santa to great risk on, on numerous occasions. But we're willing, to mm. take, we're willing to take that risk because we feel it's right to pursue this inquiry and nobody else is really pursuing it. That's why we spent seven years scuba diving because not enough marine archaeology is looking at the submerged continental shelves, you know. And if we can find structures that are indisputably man-made, for example, the, the great stone circle of Akajima in the Kerama Islands in Japan, there's a, a depth of about 100 feet beneath the surface. There's an enormous stone circle hewn out of solid rock with multiple other structures all around it. And even the most skeptical geologist who I took there could not claim that that was a work of nature. That was made by human beings. And therefore, it was made about 12,000 years ago, judging from the depth of submergence, which turns out to be around the time that Gobekli Tepe was built in, mm. built in Turkey. You know, that's why, that's why we did that work. We dived in Micronesia. We dived in the Mediterranean. We dived extensively in India. There's a tradition of a lost city called Dwarka up in the northwest of India. We dived there with the National Institute of Oceanography. Um, and there, and indeed, there are enormous structures underwater at Dwarka. Um, and, and there's the, uh, the tradition of Kumari Kandam in South India. Uh, the, it's, the, it's the Indian Atlantis, if you like. Uh, there's a tradition that India was much extended much further to the south than it does today that the island of Sri Lanka was joined to mainland India, uh, and that this extensive land was the host to a high civilization that, uh, that had academies and studies, studied the world, studied the, studied the universe, but it was destroyed in a great flood. Well, it turns out that that's exactly true. Sri Lanka was joined to South India during the Ice Age when sea level was 400 feet longer. The Maldive Islands were much bigger than the tiny archipelago that they, that they are today. Uh, it makes complete sense. And we went diving in that area. My wife, Santha, uh, speaks Tamil as her first language. And, and Tamil is the language of South India. So we, we were able, through Santha, to talk fluently uh, with local fishermen and local divers off the coast of Southeast, uh, Southeast India. And at Mahabalipuram, they told us, there's a city underwater here. Um, and uh, we said, how do you know that? And, 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 and they said, well, it's actually annoying. We keep catching our nets on it. Uh, you know, we'll cast our nets to catch fish and they'll get stuck on a structure underwater. And then we have to send down a diver to free the nets. Sometimes those divers die. Oh, wow. um, and and um, we, we'd like something done about it. And we, and we said, you know, would you... Would you take us to the to the site and, and show us? And eventually, that's what happened. We 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 went out there and we did multiple dives. And true enough, 
down to depths of 27 meters. Again, you're looking at about 12, 11,000 years ago. They were last above water. There are enormous, un, indubitably man-made structures. We had some Indian archaeologists diving with us there, and they didn't dispute that. These are absolutely man-made structures. And it was those archaeologists themselves from the National Institute of Oceanography who took us to Pumpahar, uh, where we again dived on a, an enormous man-made structure at about 27 meters. So there, if, if, we can, if we can find this with our, with our limited resources, uh, taking the risks that we took, talking to local fishermen and divers, working with local archaeologists when we could. If we can, if we can find this, then what could be found if a concerted effort were made worldwide to explore the flooded continental shelves? Uh, and I think that what would be find, found is not only evidence of hunter-gatherer cultures, which certainly will be found there, but evidence of cultures that we would recognize as a high civilization. Wow, wow. So... I get. What's the right term for mainstream archaeology? Just... Well, archaeologists themselves say there's no such thing as mainstream archaeology. Yeah, there's only archaeology. Like yeah, they're, they're there's like, only archaeology. Like, so uh, and right, there, I mean, and right yeah. there, you have you have the notion that no dispute will be accepted. Right. right. You know, there's this there's this there's, narrative. There's no this is archaeology. There's no alternative. Mm -hmm. There's only archaeology, and any alternative is pseudoscience. That's why they label me as a pseudoscientist or a pseudo archaeologist. Because that's a very lazy, very easy way to turn people off my work without yeah. really getting to grips with the work at all in, in any way. Just call the guy a pseudo-archaeologist. Yeah. You know, when, when the word pseudo means false, you know, so yeah. false archaeologist. How can I be a false archaeologist? I, I don't claim to be an archaeologist. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to be an archaeologist. Right. I want to be me doing what I do. Um, which is which is fundamentally a work of investigative journalism. That's mm -hmm. that's that's what I do. Um, but it's a very useful label to yeah. attach to an opponent, yep. uh, just as labeling me as a racist or a white supremacist uh, or a misogynist. They, amazingly, the Society for American Archaeologists used all of these labels in connection with with my Netflix series. They said that it promotes racism, uh, white supremacism, <laughs> um, misogynism, and anti-Semitism. It's absurd. None of those issues are what? raised no. in the series at all. No, in any way, race is not. It, that makes no sense. Yeah, but, that, but 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 when you understand that a propaganda war is going on, and that yeah. the objective of those archaeologists was to destroy by any means, fair or foul, mm -hmm. an alternative narrative, yeah. then it begins to make sense. They thought if they could just apply those labels enough times, mm -hmm. they would be repeated in enough sources that people would begin to believe that that was the case and wouldn't feel they needed to look at my work. Yeah. You know? Someone comes across your Netflix series or one of your books, looks you up, the first thing they go to is Wikipedia, pseudoscientist. Yeah, yeah. Wikipedia. All right, well, That's not going to... Exactly. You know, Why bother with this guy? Right, He's a pseudoscientist. Right. It's such a shame. And, and, they, and, and what they're not aware of um, is that uh, precisely the same small group of angry, furious, envious archaeologists... Mm -hmm. Uh, who launched the attack against my Netflix series and who've been and who've been attacking me in the case of John Hoops from the University of Kansas for more than 30 years, uh, precisely that same group of arch archaeologists are the moderators on my Wikipedia page. Of course yeah. they are. You know, and they will not allow anybody to edit my page. They control mm -hmm. it completely. So let's forget about the idea that Wikipedia is a balanced objective source. Oh, absolutely not. When, when it cannot be a balanced objective source if the person being described in that Wikipedia entry is being described by a group of self-declared enemies yeah. of that person. Yep. It can't Makes be. No and, sense. and I don't, you know, I don't know about other issues than other people, but I know from my own experience of Wikipedia that Wikipedia's entries on me are dishonest. And mm -hmm. I suspect that that's true of many of the entries in oh, Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia is a source of disinformation rather than information. But it's the first port of call for many people. They've heard something new. Yeah. They want to find about it. Yep. If, if you search Graham Hancock, the first hit you'll yeah. get is Wikipedia. Yep. It's right there. It's right, yeah. it's right there. And, and many people are still under the mistaken illusion that Wikipedia is objective. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in fact, it has an agenda. Uh, certainly does on, on on a number of issues, and my issue is one of those issues. I think it's because people associate it with encyclopedia. They think it's just factual. Yeah, they, they think it's just factual, it. and and that there's no bias, you know, and that mm -hmm. that rigorous pro pro processes right. are followed in order to yeah. to create. What authority the is this? That and 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 and, it. and and it's just it's just not. It's mm -hmm. uh, purely ideological uh, yeah. in 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 my in my case. So I would ask people 
who've been exposed to this uh, propaganda that's been directed against me and my work actually take a look at the work itself. Yeah, make your you know, own don't decision. be driven away from it. And 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 in addition to the to the Netflix series and uh, and other television I've done, look at the books. You know, because in a in a television series, you, you can, can only, only do say, so much. You can yeah. only say so much right, in episodes right. that are half an hour long. Yeah. Um, and and um, in a book, you can devote hundreds and hundreds of pages right. to an there's issue. There's no and limit. You can, and you, there's no limit. And you can underwrite it with footnotes that go on and give you give all the sources in in detail. Mm -hmm. And in the in the critiques of me and my work, I've noticed that the archaeologists steer away from my more recent books because I've learned as I've gone along. When I when I wrote Fingerprints of, of the Gods in 1995, I was less rigorous than I am today, uh, because I hadn't learned the lesson yet mm -hmm. that everything mm -hmm. I do is going to be exposed to very harsh criticism. Um, and the lesson that I learned is that I need to really reinforce my arguments, and I need mm -hmm. to I need to make sure that when I rely upon a source, that that source is reliable. We've so learned in, that lesson in, too. <laughs> sorry? We've learned that lesson too yeah, over the yeah. years. It's important yeah. to, to, to rely on reliable sources. It is. So, you know, in more recent books like Magicians of the Gods, which was published in 2015, and America Before, which was published in 2019, um, I have been very, very, very careful. And indeed in Underworld that was published in 2002, I've been very, very careful about documenting my sources mm -hmm. and relying on sources that could not be easily dismissed but all of this is just ignored by by archaeologists actually yeah. one of those one of those archaeologists behind the society for american archaeologists attack on on my netflix series um who accused me of being racist racist said but ha effectively what he said was hancock was very clever in not mentioning race in his series but we all know he's a racist anyway you know? <laughs> god i mean where, what where, what is that it's what kind of ridiculous. what kind of what kind of decent scholarship is that yeah to say things like that you Absurd. know that 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 despite the fact that race is not mentioned in this series at all uh we are still going to accuse hancock of racism of course i think it's really i think it's just hard too because with your series especially if people are coming to your series your netflix series and that's the first thing they see of you or yep. hear you mm -hmm. talk about these things i can understand how you know, say there's an archaeologist never heard of you before. They watch your Netflix series mm -hmm. and you're saying these things. And it's very easy to pick it apart, so to speak, because you're not able to include those sources. Yeah. And everything's right. edited and like so yeah. highly produced. Because yeah. like yeah. one yeah. of the I was watching an archaeologist, a, a YouTuber who's an archaeologist, and, and he did like a four part YouTube series. You might have probably seen it, but he was like just picking apart every single episode that you did. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said is that, oh, well, you know, they they cleverly edited the the talks with the archaeologists to make it look like they were siding with you and things like that. And I was like, what? What are you even talking about? Like, You know, um, Netflix are very professional. Mm -hmm. um, they don't make their own shows. The shows are commissioned from independent production companies. The independent production company that made my series is ITN Productions in the UK. That's independent television news pr productions. They triple fact-checked every fact that was stated. Yep. in that in that series and netflix absolutely insist upon that mm -hmm. uh, and what was thrown against the series was spin and lies yeah. and misrepresentation mm -hmm. you know um uh, straw man attacks hancock says this hancock does that the series was edited in this or that or such and such a way um they're all they're all fundamentally designed to turn people off the work and to keep control keep rigid control of the narrative and 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 yeah sure i mean there are some youtubers who've uh, taken advantage of of the notoriety of the right, series right. to help to oh, get, yeah, it's, to get it's their view videos up, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah um so so that is that is going to happen and that's why i i, I insist uh in the debate that's coming up i will debate a, a, an archaeologist on the joe rogan experience on the 24th of october oh it's going to be on joe yeah. rogan interesting that's that's happening on the 24th of october oh, wow. uh, i would have liked the archaeologist to be John Hoops from Kansas University because he's just been <laughs> yeah. so obnoxious about me. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't have the guts to put his money where his mouth is and actually sit down uh -huh. in a face-to-face -face debate with me. Just Funny how that and, works. And he vented all kind of excuses. He said, um, oh, I can't uh, debate metaphysics with archaeology. What? Well, no. The fact of the matter is he just doesn't have the stomach to sit down yeah. opposite me and be confronted with his lies. Mm -hmm. um, it's as simple as that. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll state it plainly. The man is a coward. This mm. is cowardice. Um, in the case of Flint Dibble, who's taken over, he's going to debate me. 
Um, he's an American archaeologist who presently teaches in the in in the UK, and uh, and he's also been <laughs> very vituperative in his in his critiques of me. Um, but that's exactly what I want. I want I want to debate uh, a, a, an absolutely rooted and grounded mainstream archaeologist who is teaching at a major university, and and therefore who is responsible for the institution of archaeology as a whole. I don't want to debate some sort of recent teenage newbie who's, who's right. doing a YouTube channel. <laughs> I, wanted, I, I, I want the debate to be with yeah. a thoroughly respected figure within the field of archaeology because that way the debate will be a historic moment. Right. Yeah. And, and what I say and what that person says will stand for a great deal more than just our immediate encounter. It, it, it really is the first time this has ever, this has ever happened. Yeah. So I'm grateful to Flint Dibble for, for being willing to do this debate. And... Uh, I very much look forward to it. What's his Me argument too. against you? Like if like from a aerial <sighs> oh, view. Oh, Hancock's work uh, supports racism and white supremacy. Oh, so he's on that trail. He's on that trail oh, as well. Wow. Hancock's declared war on archaeologists. Well, no, actually. You work 30 with years them. ago, yeah. archaeology declared war on me, yeah. the institution yeah. of archaeology. And and um uh I, I see what I'm doing as self-defense, you know. When 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 I said in the series that I'm public enemy number one to archaeologists, well, that actually is what I am. Um, and and uh, it, it's it's worth making that that clear. There's been I, I've not seen from Flint Dibble any any you know detailed specific critiques of things that I say. And there's been a lot of I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve quite a lot of what I have to say for the debate yeah. itself because mm -hmm. I have chapter and verse on this, and there has been there has been some very egregious misrepresentation of me and what I said and what was said in the series. They misrepresent it. And they attack it and they say, oh, we've got this evidence that proves that was right. If you actually get into that evidence, you find it doesn't prove uh, that what we said was wrong at all. Uh, but it sounds good, you know, yeah. if they say, oh, we evidence proves that this was not the case. So a, I, I'm not going to go into the details because I want to keep my ammunition yes. for the uh, for sure. Understandable, for, the yeah. for sure. Yeah, so just to, just to conclude on this issue of a debate, uh, John Hoops from Kansas University who is one of my major critics, didn't have the grit to sit down face to face and debate me on the Joe Rogan experience. Uh, Flint Dibble has agreed to debate me on the Joe Rogan experience, and he's also a highly credentialed archaeologist involved in ongoing digs in Greece and uh, teaching at a, major, at a major university. I don't think Flint Dibble is going to weasel out of the debate uh, in the way that John Hoops did. I think Flint, Flint Dibble has enough character to see it through. But in the event, for one reason or another, that he does pull out of the debate, I'm prepared to debate somebody else, but that somebody else must be, I'm going to use the word mainstream, must be an established mainstream archaeologist. He must be teaching at a major university. He must have been involved in extensive archaeological digs. And he must be willing to take the risk of putting his whole career and the whole institution of archaeology on the line in front of an audience of tens of millions of people. I will not debate some wannabe who's got a YouTube channel. Uh, that is not enough. I, that, is, that, that is a waste of my time and my energy. This debate has to be at a high level. And I want archaeology to throw at me the highest level they possibly can. Uh, and right now, because most archaeologists haven't wanted to debate at all, right now that highest level is Flint Dibble. And I hope, Flint, if you're listening to this, I hope that you will be there and debate me on the Joe Rogan experience on the 24th of October. Um, if you can't be there, I hope you will find another colleague who is equally well qualified as you, who can respectably stand up and represent the institution of archaeology. And then we will have a worthwhile debate. Well, if they're so confident, why wouldn't they debate you? I know. Yes, it's true. Well, well, well. Yes, there's that that feeling that you know we don't want to give Graham Hancock a platform. You know. Oh, I think that's We'd, a convenient excuse. I think it's well, a you already have excuse. the platform, so yeah. they need the platform. Honestly, yes. <laughs> yeah. In the in this case, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, so this is my view. I think it's I think it's very important to have a debate about this. Uh, it's a high stakes debate. It's high stakes for me, and it's high stakes for the archaeologist who debates me. But that archaeologist must be an archaeologist with a long, detailed track record in archaeology not some wannabe yeah. who wants to make himself famous on YouTube. Well, those requirements that you're setting say a lot about your confidence in your work. Mm. I, I'm really looking forward to this debate. Yeah.
I think it's I think it's an important development, and and it is the first time that uh, that the institution of archaeology will have sat down and debated somebody who's looking at prehistory from a totally different point of view, mm -hmm. and that in in that sense it'll be useful for the whole public conversation around this, and that's what I want it to be, and that's why I'm willing to invest my energy in it. And, and uh, it's a high risk, as I say, a high risk debate for that archeologist yeah. and a high, high risk debate for me too. Anybody can screw up in a debate. You yeah, know? yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope I don't. True test of I'll, knowledge. I'll, 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 I'll do my best and, and, and to speak my truth and, and to speak truth to power. That's, that's what fundamentally I'm here to do. Challenge the, and challenge the official narrative and yeah. you know, hopefully open the minds of well, um, how else can archaeologists. We grow? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just, they act, they act like it's all, yeah. you know, set in stone, so yeah. to speak. We know and everything. Not, and, and, and that's the thing, what, what bothers me too, is that how is archaeology any different than say medicine or not, you know, other types yeah. of sciences or astronomy even. Constantly I mean, we're evolving. constantly changing our views on astronomy yes. and yes. the cosmos and stuff. Yeah. It's like, how's it any different? Uh, well, well, it shouldn't be. Uh, but it is. They 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 seem to regard themselves as as the sole interpreters, the sole group of people who have the right to interpret the past to the general public, uh, the remote past. There's a difference between history and archaeology. His, history is largely that period for which we have written documents, and archaeology is the period before that where we don't have written documents, and we must draw our conclusions from increasingly small and limited amounts of evidence that, that, that are found on, on, on sites. Um, I don't understand why there's this fixation that they've got it all nailed and that they completely understand everything. And there's, they will say, of course, we're all interested in a new discovery, but they're only interested in new discoveries that support the prevailing narrative. Right. Any new discovery that challenges the prevailing narrative, they're going to pour all manner of scorn on it in every way that they possibly can. Without without getting to to grips with it, um, and and um, you know I I think that uh, in this sense let's consider another profession like uh, piloting an aircraft. Um, I think there's a difference between archaeologists and airline pilots. You know, an airline pilot is is specifically trained in a specific set of skills to fly an airplane, and that's what an airline pilot does. But an archaeologist is responsible or has claimed to be responsible for interpreting the whole human past to us. And I'm sorry, but a small group of so-called professionals cannot own and uh, monopolize the human past in the way that airline pilots can monopolize the flying of aircraft. The human past is the property of all human beings. Right. We all have something right. to contribute on, on that issue. Uh, and, it, and it shouldn't be monopolized by a relatively tiny group of professionals who have a much too high opinion of themselves. Yeah, it's really such a shame that that's where we're at. Have you ever been in a situation where you're dealing with some health issues? You're having these unexplained symptoms. You want to know what's going on. So you turn to the internet or worse, TikTok, and you end up going down a rabbit hole, getting questionable advice from random people online. Well, there are better ways to get the answers that you're looking for, and that is by seeing an actual trusted professional, a doctor, someone who knows what they're talking about and not getting your advice from random people on the internet. And ZocDoc can help you find doctors and medical professionals that specialize in the care that you specifically need and deliver the type of experience that you want. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance and are available when you need them. And you can also find someone that treats almost every condition under the sun. No more doctor roulette or scouring the internet for questionable reviews. With ZocDoc, you have a trusted guide to connect you with your favorite doctor that you haven't even met yet. Millions of people use ZocDoc's free app to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who is patient reviewed and fits their needs and schedule just right. Now, I have found many doctors through ZocDoc myself. Even before they sponsored us, I used the service and have found so many great professionals that I truly trust and have had a good experience with because finding the right doctor can be so hard. There are so many bad ones out there. So finding someone who listens to you, takes your issues seriously and wants to help you is hard to find. And I feel like we look at reviews for everything nowadays. So why wouldn't you look at reviews for your doctor? So go to ZocDoc.com slash mile higher and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then you can find and book a top rated doctor today and many are available within 24 hours. That's ZocDoc.com slash mile higher. ZocDoc.com slash mile higher.
I wanted to, I know we've been going for a while already. I wanted mm -hmm. to shift things because one of the, one of the sites that was really interesting to me from ancient apocalypse was Bimini road. Mm. And in that episode, of course, the, the buzzword comes out Atlantis, right? Mm -hmm. And they love to attack you whenever yeah. you bring up this idea of Atlantis, even possibly existing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I was watching, you know, I, bef to prepare for this, I was kind of watching what the other side is saying. And, yeah. and they're like, oh, it's absolutely ridiculous. He refers to this as a road. This is the Bimini wall and it's a natural formation that yeah. is there. And it seems yeah. so yeah. absurd. When you dove on that site and yeah. what, what, what did you well, find? I've, I've, I've dived on that site multiple times going, going back to the, the 1990s. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite certain that it's a man-made site. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done the diving to to uh, draw that conclusion i spent a lot of time underwater on the on the so-called bimini road um and uh it is beach rock but it's been be it's beach rock that has been shaped and molded by human beings that has been leveled by placing blocks underneath blocks in a way that couldn't happen naturally yeah that was wild to see yeah. the blocks holding yeah. up yeah. those yeah. large i was like exactly there's no it, way in nature it, it, that's it, it, happening exactly like that. it's it's not as easily dismissed as they would as they would like it to be and the whole Atlantis issue, again, I've inevitably I've I've taken a look at the kind of attacks that have taken place around my my references to Atlantis. And those attacks, they always seek to isolate Atlantis and make us think that that's just the only story that there is about a lost civilization of prehistory. Whereas in fact, ancient cultures all around the world preserved a memory of a high civilization of prehistory. In India, it was called Kumari Kandam. Um, but if you go to Mesopotamia, you're going to find the same story of a great flood and survivors of a flood who taught knowledge uh, around the world. You're going to find the same story in ancient Egypt. You're going to find the same story everywhere. As a matter of fact, um, and again, I'm going to preserve most of this for the debate, the Atlantis story is present in ancient Egypt. They just don't call it Atlantis. They use a different, a different word for it. Uh, in the ancient Egyptian language. Atlantis is not an ancient Egyptian word. But that's not surprising if we consider the pedigree of the Atlantis story. Uh, the Atlantis story, as it's come down to us, the earliest surviving reference to it is in the works of Plato, right? Uh, who is a revered figure in his own right, uh, the Greek philosopher Plato, and in his dialogues, the Timaeus and the Critias. And Plato draws his information from an individual who, who may well have been an ancestor of his, Solon, uh, the great Greek lawmaker. Solon was, was famous for his codification of laws in Greece, and he was a traveler, and, and he made a well-documented visit to Egypt around about the year in our calendar, 600 BC. Okay? And in that visit to Egypt, as Plato reports the story, as he had received it, as he reports it in these, these dialogues, where he puts the words into the mouths of two people who are talking. Um, Solon was told by the priests of the Temple of Neith at Sais in the Delta, a temple that no longer exists. Um, he pointed to writings on the walls, and there was a priest who spoke Greek and ancient Egyptian, and he asked that priest to tell him, what do these writings say? And the priest then repeated the story of Atlantis. And Plato put that into the Greek language as Atlantis. We don't know what the ancient Egyptians called it there, but uh, I do know that they called it the homeland of the primeval ones from another temple. Um, and and uh, Solon then asks the priests, ah, so this Atlantis was destroyed in, a, in an enormous flood. When, when did that happen? And they said, quite matter-of-factly, oh, 9,000 years ago. So there you need to do the math. This is 600 BC that, that Solon is receiving that information that he transmits to Plato. 9,000 years before 600 BC is 11,623 years ago, if you wish to be precise. Mm -hmm. Let's say roughly 11,600 years ago. And um, this is one of the reasons why I take Plato's report seriously, because 11,600 years ago was one of those massive pulses of meltwater uh, that coincided with the ending of the last ice age, just as the Younger Dryas began 12,800 years ago with an anomalous sea level rise, documented, thoroughly documented in the, in the work of Cesare Emiliani. Um, just as it began with a sea level rise, it also ended 11,600 years ago with a massive sea level rise, which is called Meltwater Pulse 1b. 
Um, and, and when archaeologists try to get rid of this, they say, well, look, Meltwater Pulse 1B unfolded over a period of 600 years. So in any one year, you know, if you do the average, it wasn't that much. But uh, that's not how the Meltwater Pulse worked. There were years of massive rises in sea level. And again, this is documented in, in the death of corals. And, and there were years when not much happened. So, so averaging it out over 600 years is not the way to do it. We have a time in recent, relatively recent history, prehistory, 11,600 years ago, when there was enormous, an enormous global flood. And is it a coincidence that Plato names precisely that time for the submergence of Atlantis? I don't think so. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think it's another reason why we should have respect for, for, for Plato, have respect to the tradition that was passed down to him through the line of Solon, and have respect for Meltwater Pulse 1B and its complexities over a period of about 600 years. Uh, and, and finally, of course, there's the fact that Gobekli Tepe, this extraordinary megalithic site in Turkey, uh, as far as we can tell now, the work began on that site, guess when? 11,600 years ago. Uh, I, can't help, I can't help feeling that we're, that we're looking at a project that was initiated by survivors of that cataclysm uh, to, to, uh, bring to, their, to bring to that place skills and knowledge that had not previously existed in that place, to create a gigantic megalithic site, indeed partly for spiritual reasons, but also partly to mobilize a local population, uh, to give them a big project to work on, and during that project to teach them agriculture. Uh, we, at the beginning, Gobekli Tepe was entirely inhabited by hunter-gatherers. A thousand years later, uh, they were all agriculturalists, and during those thousand years, the whole Gobekli Tepe was created, and then, lo and behold, once that was achieved, it was buried, deliberately buried. More work was put into burying it than was put into creating it. Uh, these stone circles were filled up with piles of rubble, and then they created a rubble hill over the top of the whole thing. And that's why Gobekli Tepe is such an important site, because it then remained sealed. Nobody was trampling all over it. No later cultures were coming in and contaminating the carbon dating with introduced materials from a later time. It's a sealed site, and it's 11,600 years old. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and that coincides with Meltwater Pulse 1b, and that coincides with the date that Plato gives for the submergence of Atlantis. Uh, I, we can either choose to just say all of this is coincidence and it has no significance, right. or in my case, I think it's not coincidence, and I think it's really worth looking at the implications of all of this uh, with an open mind to see, to see where it leads. So Atlantis is... You're not saying Atlantis is that lost advanced civilization necessarily. They may have been no. one of the yeah, lost I'm, I'm, civilizations. I'm, 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 I'm saying that there, was, that there was a culture that emerged out of shamanism that developed certain skills that was able to explore the world and almost certainly uh, influenced other cultures around the world. May uh, have assisted in these megalithic sites across may, the world? May have assisted in these, in these megalithic sites in, in, in certain ways. I think the dating of quite a number of megalithic sites needs to be reconsidered in the light of Gobekli Tepe. The notion before Gobekli Tepe was that the oldest megalithic site on Earth was about 6,000 years old. Suddenly we have this 11,600 years old megalithic site. And clearly, the people who made it knew what they were doing. You don't move around 20-ton megaliths and carve you know, beautiful imagery into them and, and, uh, in, in, in high relief. You don't, you don't do that without, without having experience of what you're doing. You don't align them. There's no way that's a first try. No, there's no way that's a <laughs> site, first try. Yeah, there's a, there's no. obviously a hidden background to that. And, and, and that background at the moment is very hard to explain. Some archaeologists say, oh, it must have been the Natufian culture, um, which existed in that area for a thousand or two thousand years before that. But what we see from the Natufian culture is just no more dramatic than a sort of dry stone wall in Wales. I mean, it's just little mm. things, nothing, nothing big, nothing extraordinary like this. I, I am yet to see the evolutionary process that could have led to Gobekli Tepe. And, and if it's there, I think it's going to change our entire view of history. And it's interesting that now we have Karahan Tepe, which we also filmed out in the, in the, in the series, and 10 other sites have now been found uh, in that area, which all date back to that horizon around 11 or 12,000 wow. years ago. Mm. Wow. And, and goodness knows what is going to come out of all of those excavations. I mean, first of all, Gobekli Tepe was discovered by accident. Uh, Back in the 1950s, uh, a team of American archaeologists who were interested in Stone Age stuff, stuff from the, the, the Paleolithic, the Upper Paleolithic, found themselves at Gobekli Tepe. And then they saw the tip of a beautifully carved pillar sticking out of the side of the hill. And they said, nah, that's not Stone Age. 
that's way too good. That must be Byzantine. That must be from just a thousand years ago or so. So it's not our stuff. We're, we're not going to excavate it. We'll just, just wow. leave it there. And there it was left until Klaus Schmidt, a great man of the German Archaeological Institute, who I, I knew personally and who kindly showed me around Gobekli Tepe in 2013 and spent a lot of time with me. That's the kind of archaeologist I enjoy meeting who doesn't typecast me. He knew who I was. But he certainly did because we'd been in correspondence before. Um, but, but, you know, they don't automatically shut me out but they're willing to talk to me, and he was, and he was willing to talk to me. Um, and it was he who took an interest in that curious pillar sticking out of the ground and decided, yeah, let's excavate here. And lo and behold, they discovered Gobekli Tepe. Now that Gobekli Tepe was discovered, then suddenly there's a reason to look more widely than Karahan Tepe. When I first went to Karahan Tepe, it was just like Gobekli Tepe had been before, just a few bits of pillar mm -hmm. sticking out of the ground. Now it's an enormous excavated site. And as I say, at least 10 other sites uh, in that in that area of the the twelve tepes as yeah. they as they call them the twelve hills, Gobekli Tepe itself means pot-bellied hill in the Turkish language, and that's because oh. that's what it looked like yeah. huh. until it was excavated. That hill was entirely artificial, entirely man-made, designed to cover up this site. I can't help thinking time capsule that there was an intention to preserve this, knowing site. it would be uncovered later Eventually, on. Eventually, potentially, but it yeah. would be covered, but but, but uncovered. Because, because the problem with many archaeological sites is that they have been tramped over by so many different cultures over so many different periods of time that it's really hard to date them. Carbon dating only dates organic materials. It doesn't date stone. Those organic materials need to be in, in situ in a position where they could only have been placed there at the time the megalith was put in place. And that is very rare to, very rare to find. So there's a lot of speculation and guesswork goes into the dating of megalithic sites wow wow so i want to understand more in because i'm trying to remember and did you mention that you believe this lost advanced civilization was shamanistic in origin like oh yeah i okay. I, I, I believe that we're i believe the origin of all civilizations okay is yeah. shamanistic mm -hmm. and and um you know we need to use the word the words advanced and the word civilization carefully. Yeah. Because when we say advanced civilization, the natural tendency is to think of something like us. Because mm -hmm. we think we're adv an advanced civilization. Although in many ways, we're not an advanced civilization. We're a spiritually stunted civilization. Effectively yeah. destroying ourselves. And we're effectively destroying ourselves. And what's advanced about that, you know? Right. The fact that we can make machines and have all this clever tech and have cell phones and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That doesn't say that much about us, really. It, it doesn't. It doesn't speak to our qualities as as being. So, an advanced civilization, by definition, has to be has to be a civilization which is not only capable of technological feats, uh, but that is also spiritually very grounded. And it's interesting um, in the tradition of Atlantis, as passed down to us by Plato, in the tradition of the flood of Noah that we find in the in the Bible, in the Mesopotamian traditions, the Gilgamesh story, the Great Flood. Um, the figure of Oannes, the civilizing hero who emerges mm. from the waters of the flood and teaches mankind uh, the, 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 the origins of civilization. Thoth as well. Hmm? Thoth. Thoth, the god, of, yeah. the, god of, the god of wisdom. You know? mm -hmm. these, these, these accounts are, are all around the world. I've kind of lost my track. Where were we? Where were we all? What was I on? Um, sorry, just uh, talking about... Too uh, much cannabis what, yeah. last night. <laughs> <laughs> Defining One of the great joys yeah. of being in Denver. Absolutely. Right. Rocky Mountain High, baby. <laughs> um, you were d defining, because like the label, the, the thing that gets thrown yes. onto you is metaphysical, metaphy, you know, yeah. like. Yeah. And, what, and the issue of what is an advanced civilization. What is an, yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. the key issue. And I think we need to broaden our horizons right. in that respect. I, I take note of certain anomalies, those ancient maps, the ancient knowledge of precession of the equinoxes, a deep understanding of astronomy that could only be gained through hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years of very careful observation. Uh, the, the phenomena like the, the description of the Ark of the Covenant that I mentioned at the beginning and the bolts of fire shooting, shooting out of it, the, the, the mystery of the construction of the Great Pyramid, which contrary to archaeological views has never been solved. Right. Nobody knows how it was done. I mean, you are looking at 6 million tons, 13-acre footprint, 481 feet tall, 2.5 million blocks of stone in its construction. How they do it? Nobody knows how it was done. And anybody do you know how, do you I have, have a no theory? clue. I mean, how could anyone it, know? 
ar- archaeologists propose the idea that they built ramps, ramps. and yes. wet ramps sand. are the main theory, and 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 then it's yes, and sliding blocks along wet wet sand, which is fine at ground level, but really difficult to do three hundred feet above the right. sand, you know. Um, and and the notion of ramps is problematic because those those ramps couldn't have a slope in excess of ten degrees. Uh, and and if you're going to get to the top of the Great Pyramid, 480 feet above the ground, that's a steep with a top of 10 degrees. You're looking at a gigantic ramp. It's much bigger than the Great Pyramid itself. And if it's going to support the weight of multi-ton megaliths, then it's got to be really solid. It can't just be an earthen ramp. It's got to be a stone ramp. And where's all that stuff gone? Yeah, right. you know. It, the, so 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 then the, the uh, other archaeologists have tried to propose internal ramps. There's all sorts of proposals and suggestions, but there are no facts on the construction of the Great Pyramid. I like the theory of acoustic levitation. And I like that theory too. Um, and again, this is one of the areas where, where archaeologists attack They're me. like, no, what are you talking about? Because, I, because I, again, I'm referencing indigenous myths and traditions from, from ancient Egypt and, and from many cultures, which speak of large megaliths being moved into place with sound. The use of sound, which is a scientific thing, well, it's, just it's not happening. on that scale yet. Yeah, yeah, it's happening now on a very small scale. It's right. possible to use sound to levitate tiny objects. Well, if you can use sound to levitate tiny objects, perhaps you can use it to levitate very large objects as well. Perhaps we're looking at a lost science here. Well, and we that's don't a, understand. That's the thing. And actually, yeah. you know, I don't dwell in my work very much on that. I talk of the ancient Egyptian priests chanting blocks into the air because that is an ancient Egyptian tradition. But I don't, sp- I don't dwell on it a great deal. But when archaeologists want to attack my work, that's the one and a half pages in one book. They circle that they pick on and yeah. say, this is what Hancock's work is all about. Woo-woo ideas about uh, magical yeah. levitation of, of blocks. No, that's not, that's not what it's about. I, I think we're confronted by an enormous mystery with megalithic sites all around the world. Uh, and we don't understand them properly. In Peru, at, at Sacsayhuaman, and... Uh, uh, Cusco, the Sacred Valley, there are uh, extraordinarily megalithic sites there. Sacsayhuaman is the best known of them, uh, with giant megaliths fitted together with incredible precision. These are like jigsaw puzzles, and no single megalith is the same shape as another one. But they're all Amazing. cut and placed to fit perfectly together so that you can't even get a sheet of paper uh, in between the blocks. And, and uh, one of my... Uh, principal in, informants there at Cusco is Jesus Gamara, who himself is a descendant of the Incas. Um, he thinks that the Incas found that work uh, already there. Oh, wow. Uh, really? And that they overbuilt and built around it. And he speaks of ancient Peruvian traditions, and others do, about some kind of plant which softened rock. Interesting. So, so that they could mold it, almost like Play-Doh, Play-Doh or something. Yeah. And, and mold it into shape. And then suddenly, if that were the case, many anomalies of those huge megaliths, m- m- megaliths like the the, the scalloped grooves, almost like somebody's run a butter knife down the side of an edge of butter or, or holes in them that don't make any sense. All of those things suddenly begin to make, to make some kind of sense. I'm not saying that's how it was done. I'm saying that we should be open to these extraordinary possibilities and not just write them off as, as absolute nonsense. And we should respect the indigenous traditions that speak of them. Right. Well, and, that, and that's where you really differ is you're, you're not only looking at the, the physical archaeological evidence that's there, but you're also taking into consideration the indigenous cultures and yeah. the, yeah. the, I really like that about, about the, your series is that you then tell the indigenous story yeah. on what the, you know, what With they them. believe happened in, 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 in every case, in every single yeah. site yeah. that you went yeah. to. And I yeah. thought that and, was, and you talked about the Bimini Road a moment ago. This is not so much about indigenous traditions, but most people don't realize that the tiny Island of Bimini was part of a very large landmass that the, right. that the Bahama banks were all above water yeah, during right. the ice age. And there was a, a huge island there. Uh, we started the series with um, Gunung Padang in, in Indonesia. And there, our principal expert is an Indonesian uh, geoscientist right. called Danny Hillman Natuwajaja. Um, I've known Danny for years, and he's absolutely dedicated and committed to this work. And he's done a huge amount of remote sensing work. When I say remote sensing, I'm not talking woo woo, I'm talking seismic tomography. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking <laughs> getting images of what's deep underground and finding chambers deep under this, this, this structure. And Danny is quite confident from his work and from the detailed work that, that he's done that the origins of this site go back at least 20,000 years, uh, that it's a very, very ancient site. And again, archaeologists dismiss, find ways to insultingly dismiss him while claiming that they respect indigenous views. They pour scorn on this particular indigenous view 
Danny's view because it doesn't accord with their narrative. What a bunch of hypocrites yeah. they are. Yeah. It makes no sense. I don't, I don't understand it at all. I mean, why wouldn't you allow them to be a part of this conversation and, and take yeah. it more seriously? It beats me. Maybe they have some, there's, like you said, shreds of, of truth even. If you're not going to take all of it for granted, then there's shreds in there yeah, uh, of it's, it's, truth. It's, it's, the bottom line is there are matters that need to be investigated further that are not being investigated further. And the reason they're not being investigated further is not a conspiracy. The reason they're not being investigated further is that the archaeological institution is extremely arrogant mm -hmm. in its claim to sole possession of the past. And they'll say, oh, we welcome amateurs. Well, yes, they do, as long as the amateurs say <laughs> what archaeologists say. Right. Stick to the narrative. The moment you start challenging the narrative, they don't want any amateurs involved at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see them denying that fact either. Mm. You know, not saying like, oh, we welcome alternative points of view no, or anything no, like that. It's far, like, far, far from it. Because they're just so, so... Ultimately, ultimately, what we have there is a very insecure institution. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. if it was secure, if it had a really secure footing in the They'd be like, let's take a look. Yeah, let's take yeah. a look. This is the, you know, at the, at the very least, we don't need to smear and insult and wage a propaganda war against people who are presenting mm -hmm. an alternative narrative. At the very least, we don't need to do that because we're, we're so sure of our ground. They can't be sure of their ground if they're so sensitive and so defensive uh, on, on, on every single point. They just, they just can't be sure of their ground. And they shouldn't be sure of their ground. The problem is they're not sure of their ground, but they pretend they are. Oh, man. What do you think of... The other thing that there's some controversy around is the connection of the pyramids across the planet. Yes. Yeah. And I, I know for me personally, when I, when I started discovering this, I'm like, how can you not draw parallels between these different sites? And like that some will say, oh, well, those aren't technically pyramids. Like they, they didn't like your definition they, of a pyramid, the terraces are like, yeah. that mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's a pyramid. Or, I know what a, what a, what a, what a, what a tiny little trivial point to pick yeah. on. Certainly in, in Danny's view, uh, it is uh, the simplest word they to describe Gurung Panang is a, is, a, is a kind of pyramid, you know. There's, a, yeah. there's, a, there's a, the Pyramid of the Magician in, in Uxmal in uh, Mexico, which uh, all archaeologists recognize as a pyramid, but it's oval. In, this is a, 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 a word that, that can, be used, can be used quite widely. What do I think of the connection? Again, uh, it's not so long ago that it was the view that there could be no connection between New World pyramids, for example, in Mexico, and Old World pyramids, for example, in Egypt, because the New World pyramids were much younger than the Egyptian pyramids. So there couldn't be a connection there. And then the site of Caral was found in Peru by Ruth Shady Solis, who's done the full excavation. Amazing site. I've been there. There's dozens of enormous pyramids there. And they date, even on orthodox chronology, they date older than the Giza pyramids. So suddenly the notion that there could be no connection is blown out of the water. And when I say connection, I want to be clear. I don't mean that somebody from Peru went to Egypt right. and taught the Egyptians to build pyramids, or that somebody from Egypt went to Peru and taught the Peruvians to build pyramids. I mean to say that both were in receipt of a shared idea, a legacy that was passed down from earlier times. And I think that's one of the things that's missing in archaeology, uh, is an archaeology of ideas. That, uh, that, that ideas can persist through long periods of time and they can manifest in different cultures at different times. Uh, but essentially the same ideas are, are conveyed there. So it's, in my view, not an accident that as far as we know, a uh, majority of pyramids around the world or pyramidal forms are connected to notions of death and the afterlife. Right. There's a spiritual significance to There's them. There's a spiritual significance. And that, and that spiritual significance is shared where, whichever culture you find them in. And I, I think the, the most elegant, simplest explanation for all of these is that they have inherited a shared idea and are manifesting that idea in different periods of history in different cultures in slightly different ways. But right. the idea is what is ancient. At the root is, yeah. is the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that, and that's, that's just what drives me mad about archaeologists is the fact that if they can't dig it up and look at it and mm. have mm -hmm. it be this tangible physical thing, yeah. they're like, don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear about it. And and by the way, you know, their their view is that what they've dug up already is enough to give them full right. knowledge of the past, right. sufficient knowledge of the past <laughs> to say there cannot possibly have been a lost civilization. 
Right. You know, <laughs> what a ridiculous thing to say. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a, ro a lost civilization which is now accepted by archaeology within relatively recent memory, and that's the Indus Valley civilization in, right. um, in what is now Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Until the 1920s, nobody knew the Indus Valley civilization existed. To this day, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, interpret their, their script. Um, but uh, it was discovered by accident. Why? Because a railway line was being built. Uh, and as it was being built, it exposed the remains of a civilization that nobody imagined had existed before. Uh, so, you know, it happens. And I believe it's going to happen again. We're going to see more physical evidence for this, more as time goes by. I agree. And I think, how can you just discount the fact that we have set proof that we had an ice age mm. where there was, you know, water levels rose 400 feet. Mm. The significant amount of evidence is likely underwater. Mm. You've found sites yeah. that are clearly man-made underwater. Yeah. It's like, what else is under there? You know what I mean? Exactly. No. A tiny fraction of the continental shelves have been have been explored. Um, you, you you know the, the 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 fact of the matter is, archaeology should be more humble, mm -hmm. and more open, and less scathing, and unpleasant. As I say, I didn't declare war on archaeology. Archaeology declared war on me. And that's made it necessary for me to defend myself. And uh, when I have to defend myself, I will do so vigorously. But I didn't start this fight. I didn't even expect it. When I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, I had no idea what was coming. None, none wow. whatsoever. <laughs> that must have been a rude awakening. It was, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a rude awakening. And weird, weird that a few archaeologists are so obsessed with me that they've made me They're like life the, mission the main too. focus of their life mission. How how weird is that? Go, go, go away, do some archaeology, guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, time. <laughs> use the time well yeah. in, instead of trying to destroy somebody else's reputation. Because at heart, you're jealous, you're envious. Yeah. You can't bear the fact that your narrative is being challenged. Yeah, what a disservice to humanity. Yeah, I I I I think so. But I have great hope in the younger generation of archaeologists. I've met many archaeologists in the field, younger people in the twenties. Uh, who are just getting in, and they're much more open. I'm not saying every one of them, but they're, they're much more open in general uh, than the older than the older archaeologists. And by the time they've done the legwork and really got got into the excavations and into teaching this subject, I think archaeology will transform itself as time goes by. Much like everything else, yeah. I think I think we're in, and I know you've said this before. We're start, you know, people are starting to wake up, and people are starting to wake starting up in every way. This is this is why what what I see in my particular issue with archaeology and the the battles that I've had with archaeology, it's just a tiny slice of a much bigger battle that's going on in society today, and that is um, that is the battle between people who think for themselves and people who want to say that we think for you, we tell you mm -hmm. what to think. Uh, so there is increasing rejection of the cult of the expert in our society. There's increasing questioning of, of so-called leaders who tell us what to think and what to do. Um, and I think it's the, very much the same with, with, with archaeology. We, we need to move on to the next level of, of human society, where it's, where it's understood that we all have a stake in what we understand about reality and the world we live in. And it can't be limited to just a few people in trying to understand it. Can we talk a little bit more about a global cataclysm and mm. what that would have looked like? That's something that is so interesting to me. Well, look, there's uh, one of the points here is that the, in geological terms, we're talking about something really recent. Mm -hmm. Even in human terms, we're talking about something really recent. We have, we have skeletal remains of anatomically modern humans that go back 300,000 years from mm -hmm. Morocco. We're talking about something that happened between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And in geological terms, that's just yesterday. Right, right. Uh, and, and, and in many other terms, it's just yesterday as well. Uh, in, in, in human terms alone, 11,600 years ago just isn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's no doubt, I don't think anybody could seriously dispute that the episode called the Younger Dryas was a global cataclysm yeah. on an enormous scale. And that it led to the extinction of the megafauna, uh, all the megafauna of the Ice Age, all those iconic animals, the mammoths, the mastodons, the giant sloths, the woolly rhinos, you know, the saber-toothed tigers, they all go extinct at that right. time. That doesn't happen accidentally. They, they, at the same time, we know there was huge climatic turbulence, sea level rise, freezing temperatures. 
it's not surprising that 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 they that they went extinct. Everybody accepts that the Younger Dryas was a cataclysm. The question is, what caused that cataclysm? And at the moment, there is one major, solidly documented and consistently argued theory, and that is the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, mm -hmm. which suggests that the Earth ran into the path of a fragmenting giant comet. Uh, all comets break up into multiple fragments. It's a, it's a normal behavior for comets. Every shooting star that we see in the skies, whether it's the Taurids, whether it's the Aquarids, whether it's the Leonids, whether it's the Orionids, all of them are the remnants of comets that are broken up into multiple fragments. And very often those fragments are extremely small, just dust size. And that's what a shooting star is. It burns up in the atmosphere before it, it hits the Earth. Larger fragments uh, will blow up in the air if they're maybe 100 meters across like the Tunguska event on the 30th of June, 1908 in Siberia. That was an airburst. The object didn't reach the ground. It's calculated to have been about 100 meters in diameter. It uh, flattened 2,000 square miles of trees. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, this was an enormous event. Serious Fortunately, yeah. it happened in an uninhabited area. And as far as we know, nobody was killed. Um, but th for, the, for, for the Tunguska event to have taken place over a major city, would have been horrendous. The results, the result would have been millions of deaths. Um, and 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 it's interesting that that occurred on the thirtieth of June, nineteen hundred and eight, because that's at the peak of what are called the Beta Taurids. There's a meteor stream that the Earth passes through twice a year called the Taurid meteor stream, and the scientists who are working on the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis um, are of the view that the Taurid meteor stream is the remnant of that giant comet that caused that cataclysm 12,800 years ago. They think it entered the inner solar system about 20,000 years ago. Calculations suggest that it must have been about 100 miles in diameter, really big. Um, and as it became subject to gravitational forces in the inner solar system, it began to break up into multiple fragments. And in so doing, it became a much wider threat. When it's just one object, the chances of hitting it are actually very low. But when it breaks up into thousands of objects and they start to spread out into, in, 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 into a meteor stream that's ultimately 30 million kilometers wide, the chances of running into something big in there are, are much higher. Um, so the, the suggestion is that the torrid, what we now call the torrid meteor stream, that's simply because it appears to emanate from the area of the sky occupied by the constellation of Taurus. In fact, it's got nothing to do with Taurus. And in past generations, past times, it would have appeared to emanate from different parts of the sky. Hmm. Um, the, the view is that the torrid meteor stream is the culprit. It's the, it's the remnant of that giant comet. It still has very large objects in it. Interestingly, one of them is called Comet Enki. It's about six kilometers in diameter. Comet Enki is a fragment of that original giant comet. Uh, Olgiato, Rudniki, a number of very large objects have already been identified in the torrid meteor stream. 30 million kilometers wide, multiple filaments of debris. Some of those filaments are just small objects. Some of them are very large objects. Some of the calculations by the astronomers suggest that there may be an object that's more than 30 kilometers wide in the torrid meteor stream, oh which, is, which is completely dark. We've not, we've not yeah. seen it yet. When comets, when comets stop outgassing, a dark tar coats their surface, and they become very, very hard to see. Um, so it's interesting that, that we had an impact that happened at the very peak of one of the two crossings of the torrid meteor stream. Uh, 30th of June, 1908, the Tunguska event. Uh, and, and this connects us back to 11,600 years ago and 12,800 years ago when other crossings caused the beginning and the end of the Younger Dryas. The end of the Younger Dryas is harder to explain by cometary activity than the beginning, but it can still be explained that way. The great astrophysicist Sir Fred Hoyle, long before there was a Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, was puzzled by the sudden warming and sea level rise in Meltwater Pulse 1b 11,600 years ago. And he just floated the idea, maybe a fragment of a comet hit one of the world oceans and sent up an enormous cloud of water vapor into the upper atmosphere and caused a greenhouse effect that led to the heating that rapidly followed 11,600 years ago. Just as 12,800 years ago, the world went into a deep freeze. 11,600 years ago, it rapidly came out of that deep freeze and went very, very, very warm. So that's, in my view, one of the best theories. But there are other, there are other possibilities. Some, some of my colleagues in this field believe that 
that it's better attributed to solar activity of one kind or another. I can see solar activity being implicated in the end of the Younger Dryas. I find it harder to see it being implicated in the beginning of the Younger Dryas. What happens at the beginning of the Younger Dryas is really puzzling. You have to picture North America, and North America was the epicenter of the disaster. We're looking at a, we're looking at a, 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 a patchwork of debris that, that crosses the whole of North America from the, from the West Coast to the East Coast, goes deep down into South America, actually goes down as far as the south of Chile, continues far east into Europe, the Younger Dryas boundary layer is found in Belgium, and even further east into Syria, where you have the site of Abu Huraira, where the, the Younger Dryas boundary layer is also present. When I say the Younger Dryas boundary layer, I mean a layer in the earth, about the width of a human hand, that is full of objects that could only, in that concentration, have been caused by a cosmic impact. Mm. Iridium, platinum, glass that's been, that, that, that's been created by the melting of sand at colossally high temperatures, melted quartz, you need 2,000 degrees centigrade to melt quartz. Uh, you, you, you know, yeah. the, 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 the carbon microspherules, all these things in abundance brought together, the single best explanation for them is that there was either an airburst or, a, or a, an impact with the ground at that, at that site. And, and this is found uh, all, all around the world. So I think, I think the Younger Dryas impact, again, it's had its opponents. It's been attacked multiple times. Many of those attackers... One of them is, a, is an astrophysicist called Mark Boslow. Uh, they will pretend that they have completely debunked the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, but they have not debunked the Younger Dryas. Every attempt to debunk it has been diligently, systematically responded to by the team of 60 or more scientists, real scientists, behind the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, and they've debunked the debunkers. It still stands very strongly, and the evidence for it is getting stronger and stronger and stronger every day as more research is being done. And this is one of the very important research projects that needs to be undertaken to understand the Younger Dryas boundary layer, to understand this cataclysm that affected the Earth 12,800 12, years ago. But yes, there is some, some dispute about what caused that what caused that cataclysm. Perhaps like a solar flare, solar storm, that's something another, from That's the another sun. possibility, particularly at the end of the Younger Dryas when you get this massive warming it's difficult to see how the sun could be implicated in a sudden freeze. Yes, solar activity could decrease, but, but a sudden freeze should not release large amounts of icy water into the world ocean. And that's what happened 12,800 years ago. Not only did the world get very cold, you would expect in a cold spell that excess water would stay frozen on the ice caps. You wouldn't expect it to leave the ice caps, to leave in particular the North American ice cap and flood into both the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean, to cut the Gulf Stream, to stop it flowing. The Gulf Stream is part of the central heating system of our planet, um, overturning meridional circulation. These currents that run all around, all around the planet, they're part of what keep the planet, planet warm, and it's just a plain fact that the Gulf Stream was cut for more than a thousand mm. years during the Younger Dryas, and it was cut, this is not disputed, it was cut by freezing water flowing into the ocean, and stopping it and stopping it working. But then nobody's asking the next question. What caused that freezing water to get into the ocean in the first place, you know? Yes. And that's where the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis offers a very good answer, that it's the heat and shock of a series of impacts across the North American ice cap that released that water, that cut the Gulf Stream, and then the world became extremely cold. Wow. And we are technically due for something like this again. That means again the calculate the calculations of the astronomers. A number of astronomers working on the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis are concerned about the next thirty or forty years. Um, the Torrid Meteor Stream has not been studied enough. It's mm -hmm. something, you know, it's something that needs a lot more focus than it's getting because it's a real and present danger to life on Earth. It needs to be studied more carefully. But those who have studied it are concerned about those multiple filaments of debris in it and that, uh, that we are likely to be encountering some very lumpy objects in the Torrid Meteor Stream uh, over the next 30 or 40 years. And it's not gloom or doom. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. That's one of the good things about our tech. We have, we have the tech now to stop that happening. That's true. If we pay attention to it, if we stop, you know, hating and fearing and suspecting one another and stop making wars mm -hmm. upon one another Actually and, and take the talents and the, and the resources of the human race yeah. and put it to work on sweeping our cosmic environment clean so that we don't have to face another younger Dryas. Uh, it could be done. It could easily be done. It's just a choice. We just have to make, yeah. we just have to make that choice. What would that look like? 
it's so hard for me to wrap. What is cleaning? Well, what, does what, that what mean? it means, first of all, for me is is a close investigation of the torrid meteor stream uh, and a close look at all of the objects circulating in it. And if, um, as appears likely, some of those objects may be on a course to collide with the Earth over the next 30 or 40 years, we just need to nudge them slightly. You, huh. don't, you don't need to blow them up. It's not a good idea to blow up things in space because then instead, yeah, of, right. instead of having a, a single bullet, you have a shotgun blast, right. you know, uh, which is equally deadly. Uh, but, but NASA has already done some, some work on this, on nudging an asteroid uh, hmm. or, or the moon of an asteroid out of, out of position quite, quite recently. It is possible to change their trajectory and their order. It is something we can do something about, as are most of the problems faced by the human race, actually. Right. They're mostly problems we can do something about, We've become a geological force ourselves. What's needed is the level of spiritual development, the level of consciousness development. We can't stay locked in this low consciousness state that we've been in for the last hundred years or so yeah. and solve these problems. We have to graduate to a higher state of consciousness in order to solve these problems. And we won't solve them. As I think it was Einstein who originally said this. We won't, we won't solve them with the state of consciousness that we've got now. We need, to, we need a new one. We need a new way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 then and then it can happen and and um, you know human humanity united uh, with our fantastic imagination and our creativity and our ability um, is capable of doing almost anything uh, and we're capable of making the earth safe but the first and foremost thing we have to do is make and make the earth safe for ourselves and for our grandchildren uh, and we have to stop making wars upon one another uh, and we have to recognize our shared humanity. Uh, that and I, I mentioned this in our previous discussion. That that my experience is that people all around the world have the same hopes, the same fears, the same ambitions, uh, and it's absurd and trivial to divide people according to such a ridiculous issue as skin color. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, really, you know, why 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 don't we choose another large? The skin is a large organ. Let's choose another large organ. Let's uh, let's choose the colon. Shall we divide people according to the lengths of their colons and say that those with a colon of a certain number of inches in length are superior and those with, I mean, you know, yeah. it's Ridiculous. stupid. Yeah. It's not the physical characteristics of a human being that make a human being human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's their consciousness. It's their state of mind. It's the love. It's the love that they can bring and that they can, uh, and that they can give. And when I talk of the unity of human beings, I want to be very clear. I'm not talking about a world government. No way. Right, right. I want less and less More government and preferably power. no government at all. Yeah. We may need some administrators in large and complex societies, but we don't need rulers and leaders. I don't want the human race to be welded into a single cohesive Where cultural one unit. Person at the top I love and... the cultural diversity of humanity. It's a wonderful thing that we, and, and that's also part of the reason for the survival of humanity, that we have this cultural diversity. Mm -hmm. We should recognize and value that, but we should never take the next step and say, my culture is superior to yours or yours yeah. is inferior to, to another one. No, no, we shouldn't be doing that, yeah. not at all. We should recognize the beauty and the wonder of the diversity of the human race, but we should also recognize that what divides us is much less than what unites us. And we should stop making wars upon one another and we should start respecting and being grateful for the gift of planet earth Absolutely. that the universe has given Amen. us. Yeah. It's, it's such a you know divisive time. I know I brought up before mm. around the world um, here in America, it feels like, especially with politics, we're just so divided that people are finding more and more differences. Well, see, we're politicians away benefit from, from division. Exactly. It's a distraction. It, it, and, and it gives... <laughs> It gives them something to claim, you know, I'm special. I'm more special than that one. Though. Right. You know, it, it, they, they thrive on division mm -hmm. and, and they, and it, it's in the nature of, of politics that they exaggerate and elaborate that division and, and um, try to seek to use it to increase their power. Yes. Uh, and that, that's what we need to grow out of. And we're going to grow out of it by thinking for ourselves um, and, and by, by recognizing what a precious gift it is to be alive. And, mm -hmm. and nurturing human life. And, and the time for wars has come to an end. Mm -hmm. we, I don't know what the fuck does it get it? Vladimir Putin thinks he's doing in Ukraine, but it's a really bad idea. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't like the, I don't like the way that China is going right now. I, I don't want to live in a world ruled by China, frankly. They're, they're too mm -hmm. much in, into rigidly enforcing a particular narrow perspective. 
Uh, and and in our own way in the West, we're also doing the same thing, just more subtly and cleverly through advertising and television and media and so on and so forth. Um, we 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 need to grow out of that stage of development. No more wars, please. There are much bigger problems that need to be dealt with. But the present low level of consciousness of leadership around the world, I can't think of a high consciousness individual anywhere in the world who's in a place of leadership right now. Uh, almost by definition, if they want to be leaders, their consciousness is already low. And we, we don't need to be led by low consciousness individuals. We don't need to be led at all. We're perfectly capable of leading ourselves. It seems like a lot of people are waking up to yes, that idea. Definitely. Do you have hope in the younger generation? generation? I have great hope in the younger generation. Oh, that's and, good. Uh, you know, I, I, I have eight grandchildren, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's magical to watch them growing up. And, and thinking for themselves. Uh, Santa and I have six, six children between us, and these eight gr grandchildren are the result of that. And, and we hope we've passed on something of a free spirit of inquiry and open-mindedness to our kids and that sure they're passing have. it on to the grandkids. And I think there's, 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 there's great hope for the future. We, you know, in many ways, today's political leadership are stuck in a 19th century mindset. Big time. But we're in the 21st century now, and that mindset is no longer useful. It doesn't serve the human race. And we need to graduate beyond that. And I believe we will. I, be I believe we will. That, as we said in the previous con conversation, yeah. the power of love cannot be underestimated. And that is the fundamental attribute of humanity. We have many nasty attributes as well, but our ability to love, to care for others, to give nurture, and we can trace that back deep into the past. That's really the vital quality of humanity. So I've I've got to ask because this is a burning question I have, and I, this may be too far <laughs> I know out you there. You have many, but um, so this lost advanced civilization is it possible that they were clearly advanced in many different ways, and maybe ways that we don't even understand, which seems likely to me. Is it possible that some of them survived? Is there descendants of that civilization still around today? Or first of all, I don't think we should be looking for a genetic signal of that civilization. Okay. Because I think that that uh, that civilization was not confined to one particular ethnic group. I think it was much more widespread than that. Um, uh, the myths and traditions of the whole world speak of an enormous cataclysm and the destruction of a civilization, and that there were survivors of that civilization. But what they passed on primarily was knowledge, not genes. Um, so we're not going to find a genetic answer to this. Part. What about technology? Uh, yes, the knowledge included the knowledge included certain kinds of technology. Um, is it possible? So one of one of my theories is obviously right now one of the big big topics uh, of humanity right now is the UFO mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. and obviously everybody's for you know just based on you know kind of what we're programmed to think is like these are aliens, these mm -hmm. are extraterrestrial visitors. I sometimes believe that what if they are humans mm -hmm. in some way shape or form whether they're they were they've been here for a very very long time and somehow survived in complete secrecy i mean we we don't know what's fully under antarctica we don't know yeah where did they go inside the earth after this cataclysm and survive somehow and yeah continue to Look, advance? i think an open mind is 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 really important in in connection with a phenomenon like the the the, the ufo and and uh, et contact or what is construed as et contact um, as I mentioned in the previous discussion, in deeply altered states of consciousness, there are, and I've had these experiences myself, there are repeated reports of contacts with entities, often wise and teaching entities, uh, who, and sometimes cruel entities, who were seen in the Middle Ages as fairies and elves, who shamans see as spirits, and the world they dwell in is the spirit world not fairyland. Um, and today they're seen, they're construed as, as aliens who've come here in high-tech flying saucers or spacecraft or whatever from, from, from other planets. But it's the same phenomenon all the way down the line. And interestingly, before he passed away, I had the opportunity to talk to the ayahuasca artist and shaman Pablo Amaringo. And Pablo, uh, in his paintings of his ayahuasca visions, frequently, frequently paints flying saucers. Mm, yeah. um, and uh, I asked him what that was about. I, I said, what are these things? And, and why are they in your paintings? And are they beings coming here from 
other planets in, in high-tech vehicles. And he said, no, not from other planets. He said, those vehicles are vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world. Oh, interesting. And when a shaman speaks of a spirit world, he's pretty close to a quantum physicist speaking of a parallel dimension. So I, I, the, the, the explanation I'm drawn to most of all is, is interdimensional contact. Uh, mm. and, and that's why we need to take this, this serious. Do you know um, the great psychologist uh, Jung uh, wrote a book about flying saucers? Um, he was interested in archetypes, and uh, he viewed flying saucers in that light back in the 1950s. Or even. But then he said one thing. He said that the, the occasionally a flying saucer shows up on a radar screen. There's a trace on a radar screen. Right. And then he said, when I consider that a bottomless abyss opens up my feet. You know, that they're, these are, in some way, these are physical objects. Right. And I think the, the, the honest answer is we don't know what they are, uh, but we cannot sneer at and dismiss people's experiences of encounters with these objects. And again, there may be a great deal that we have to learn from shamanism uh, in this regard. Yeah, well, there's a, you know, there's a number of individuals out there who tie consciousness to interacting with these these beings that whatever are they there, are whatever they are yeah, you know yeah, that there's yeah. and just from you know s stories going back to roswell i mean then there's the rendlesham forest incident mm. where these craft have glyphs and different mm. things that tie back to ancient civilizations is very interesting to yeah, me yeah and I, it, my position is i haven't needed i haven't needed aliens yeah right who crossed interstellar space in high-tech vehicles who managed to maneuver their way, to find, navigate their way to this beautiful blue dot of a planet and then built the Great Pyramid. I don't need aliens for that. I, I need a human civilization that had higher abilities than those that archaeologists are per presently prepared to attribute to ancient human civilization. Um, I think that we do see a tiny measure of human error in the Great Pyramid's slightly, slightly off alignment to true north. Three sixtieths of a single degree is a tiny, tiny mm -hmm. error. Mm -hmm. But it is an error. And if you can cross interstellar space you're not making and find Earth, and your project is to build a pyramid, mm -hmm. and you want to align to true north, you're not going to make that mistake. So I, I, I felt in terms of looking at the anomalies of the past that um, I, just, I just didn't need to invoke aliens in order to explain them. It was, it was a more interesting inquiry to follow that we could be a species with amnesia that there could be a missing chapter in the human story which would answer all of these questions but is the universe full of life i can't prove it but i'm certain it is i think that's what the universe is for yeah. i think that all these planets orbiting distant stars vast distances away from us the whole universe is a theater for life not just not just planet earth um and and while i don't need them to explain the great pyramid uh, there are many mysteries, including the mysteries of consciousness and the, the contacts with entities that are experienced in deeply altered states of consciousness, uh, which should require us to think much further and much deeper and never write these things off as, as you know, simple nonsense. So you don't believe there's a chance that the gods that these ancient cultures held in such high regard and claim they received information from were necessarily extraterrestrial in origin, no, that they were just normal humans that they kind of uh, may have been may have been normal humans who are who are deified but but uh, may may equally well be uh, entities encountered in vision oh interesting as okay. well um, or maybe who, higher consciousness after all i mean where you know where does the, take the case of moses at the burning bush you know mm -hmm. i mean there's moses He's on Mount Sinai, or he's in, in, the, in Sinai somewhere, and, and here's the burning bush, and the voice of God speaks to him. Well, that's a classic altered state of consciousness experience that he's having there. Mm -hmm. There's even a suggestion that the bush was an acacia bush, right. which contains DMT. Maybe he was inhaling tripping. DMT. Maybe <laughs> yeah. he was tripping. You know? yeah. I think that it's going to turn out that all of our religions have, if you go back to their remotest origins, you'll find that their origins are in shamanism and are in altered states of consciousness. And that what happened was that then bureaucracy got involved with the religions and they kicked out the shamans and they imposed these officials to interpret spiritual issues to us. And that was when the rot set in 
uh, to all the world's uh, big monotheistic faiths at, at any rate. But I think the root and ground of it is shamanistic experience. Shamanism is at the root of everything that matters with human beings, whether it's religion or whether it's civilization. It makes you wonder if like Jesus was a shaman or... Of course he was. Yeah, yes. like it's of course, of all course, of these prophets of and um, the, the, there, there are there are individuals who have who have these special abilities to to integrate with other realms, with realms belong uh, beyond, and 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 often they are teachers. Uh, interestingly, the, the Gnostics never saw the figure of Jesus as divine. They never saw him as a god or the son of God. The, 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 that idea was actually quite obnoxious to them. They they, they saw him as a human being who was a teacher. And and um, I'm not a Christian, but I I can't find anything in the the teachings of Christ that I find obnoxious. Uh, they're all beautiful thoughts and ideas that are being expressed. The problem is how they've been perverted and distorted by the institutions that then took mm. took over. And the rot really set in when one small faction of Christianity pulled on the jackboot of the Roman state around the time of Constantine, and that became the Roman Catholic Church, which very quickly started burning Gnostics at the stake. Um, but the root of all of it is, is shamanistic experience. It's, it's when the bureaucrats get their hands on stuff that things start going radically wrong, as we see in the world today. Wow, that makes actually a lot of sense. What a, I've always been curious too about the, the Library of Alexandria, mm -hmm. and do you think a lot of of knowledge potentially pertaining to that advanced yes. civilization was lost um, when it was a, destroyed? It, it, it's, it's not the only example, but there was a consistent effort in the ancient world, particularly in to, Egypt, to gather in all knowledge. Uh, and they would take books off ships and put them in the Library of Alexandria. It was a, it was a storehouse of the knowledge of the ancient world. Um, and um, unfortunately, that storehouse is lost. Again, we're a species with amnesia. There were records in the Library of Alexandria that might give us a completely different picture of our past than the picture is presently being painted by archaeology. But unfortunately, those records are gone. What survives and what the ancients knew would survive are great stories passed down in oral tradition. Those stories can encode very significant scientific information. And this is true in the stories that concern Hamlet's mill, Amlodi's mill, the, the, this great mill that's churning in the heavens and all the number systems associated with it, they're embedded in fantastic stories that people are going to want to tell and keep on telling down the generation. And it reaches a point where the storyteller doesn't even have to know the knowledge that he or she is passing on. They don't have to know that knowledge. All they have to do is tell the story true and pass it on. Sooner or later, someone will come along who can figure out what that knowledge is. And, and in the case of precession, that someone was Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschend, who decoded those myths and found that they are full of highly sophisticated astronomical knowledge. Uh, and that knowledge has been preserved as it would not have been preserved in a written document. There are certain problems with written documents. Written documents, first of all, they can be burned and destroyed, as was the case with the li Library of Alexandria. Secondly, your written document consigned to the future may be, may be um, received by a, a, a civilization that cannot read your language, has no ability, has no Rosetta Stone to decode your language. You've got all these documents, but you can never read a word of them. We still can't read the Indus Valley script, you know. Um, so if you want to consign information to the future, you wouldn't be wise to encode it entirely in written documents. Uh, but you'd be very smart to encode, to encode it in great stories mm. because we are storytellers as human beings. And we love great stories. We do, yeah. And we pass them on. And that way they're, they're almost universal. They will almost always be preserved in one form or another. And I think, again, unfortunately, archaeologists largely sneer at myth. But I think myth, the myths of the world, those that have survived, are the hall of records of the lost past. Wow. A good example of that, at the end of your series on Netflix, mm. talked a lot about the idea of the serpents that have been carved yeah. being the asteroids. Yeah, the, 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 this is how comets are seen and were seen in many ancient cultures. They were seen as cosmic serpents. It looks like a serpent. It does. You know, flying through the heavens, especially as it breaks up into multiple parts and suddenly, suddenly you have a whole swarm of serpents coming out of the sky. They were seen and symbolized 
as serpents. And so, so those references to serpents, I'm, I'm very sure in many of the ancient myths and many of the ancient monuments around the world are speaking of ob observations of the heavens and, and a time when the earth was bom bombarded by multiple comet fragments across a huge swathe of the earth's surface. How else do they make sense of it? Yeah. They're not able to apply, apply that imagery to it and also to communicate that to yeah. the people that follow. Yeah. Do you worry if a cataclysm happens now that a lot of what we have discovered and built as a civilization will be lost because oh, yeah. we keep everything digitally? Yeah, I, I think there's a grave risk of that. Mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a matter of fact, I, I, I was written to recently by, by somebody who saw my series and, and, and read my work, and he, he believes it's time to create a new library, library of Alexandria, but not a physical library or a digital library, something that will, exactly how it's to be done remains to be seen, but, but we should be thinking about that. We should be thinking of preserving such useful knowledge as we, as we have accumulated and encoding it or placing it in such a way that it can never be destroyed by anything that, that, that happens. Um, and uh, were, were a cataclysm to occur, and perhaps we'll, we'll finish on this note, were we to confront another global cataclysm like the Younger Dryas, or a horrendous nuclear war yeah. uh, started by our deeply deceitful, vicious, cruel, dishonest leaders, uh, if such a cataclysm were to occur, and there were survivors in the advanced, so-called advanced technological societies, the best hope for those survivors would to be take, to take refuge amongst hunter-gatherers, to make their way to the Amazon. It's the hunter-gatherers to make their way to the, the Namibian deserts. It's the hunter-gatherers of this world who are the real masters of survival, whereas we in the industrial technological societies haven't got a clue most no. of us, yeah. you know, haven't yeah. got a clue. I don't, I don't know how to survive. I certainly don't. <laughs> and, 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 and then there would be the psychic shock of the collapse of our civilization. We've come to rest so much hope in it, so much, we're so, it feels so solid, so, so durable, so certain, for that to all crumble, and it could crumble in a moment because we are psychically so fragile, actually. Yeah. And that, that security that we feel that our society gives us is, is an illusion. Uh, both psychologically and physically, I think our civilization is very fragile and could easily fall apart, easily be wiped out and forgotten from the earth. Those who survived would be smart to take refuge amongst hunter-gatherers, learn from them, and perhaps pass on to them some of what they know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is, this is how I if, I, if I imagine and think, think ahead 10 or 12,000 years after that cataclysm, it would be the descendants of those hunter-gatherers um, who would be living in the world. And they would be passing down, they would have passed down stories which their archaeologists would sneer at and ignore right, about yeah. how there was once a great civilization on this planet which fell out of harmony with the universe and was, and was destroyed. And the archaeologists of that time would say, nah, nonsense, that's just some primitive myth. But actually, that civilization was us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, that's mind blowing to think about. Time to do some survival training, get out yeah. there, get in the wilderness, learn how to hunt and gather. Yeah. And in, in all Seriously, matters, though, yeah. sit at the feet of hunter gatherers yeah. and their shamans and learn from them. Mm -hmm. we, we need to take these people seriously and give them the respect they deserve. Absolutely. They are the origin of everything that's great about humanity. Yeah. And it's, Technology and AI and robots is not gonna, not gonna cut it. It's not gonna no. save us from something like that. Could destroy so, us. And that, arguably. and that's the other thing too. It could destroy yeah. us at the same time. But that's another conversation. That that's yeah. another <laughs> another we'll day. Just keep going Next all day. time, AI in the future. Uh, but well, yeah, wow, we just covered a lot of ground there, yes. and I know you're tired. We're uh, my mind is about to explode with just <laughs> the amount of information I just downloaded, but. Um, Graham, thank you so much yeah, for for coming out and coming truly, on the show. This it's been, been an honor to talk to you. It's been a total del delight. I've really loved talking to you guys. You have a great studio here. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Uh, you have a new fan. Oh, oh well, that means so much to us. We'll we'll keep it going. I mean, we're Absolutely. we're going to continue following your work. We're looking forward to the debate. But check out Ancient Apocalypse on Netflix if you haven't yes. already. Absolutely amazing. You can really put together the visuals. A lot of things we talked about in that uh, series, which was visually stunning. Very well done. And all things Graham Hancock at GrahamHancock.com. 
Mm-hmm. Thank you, Graham. Thank Please, you. anytime. Anytime you're, you're in, anytime Mile, you're in City, Mile High City, come back. And well, as you know, I love Mile High City, so yes. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll be back. Awesome. Be back. Fantastic. And thanks again to Annabelle for setting this up for us. Yes, we thank you, Annabelle. For super, that. super grateful. Yeah. Um, but that yeah, is going to be it. it for us today, guys. We will have everything linked below to find more on Graham Hancock and, you know, be exposed to more of his work. I mean, wealth of knowledge. So, Thank you. you know, you can just Reading spend endless for time. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> for, for real. Um, but that is it for us today, guys. We'll be back next week. But until then, keep, keep taking your mind, mind a mile, a mile higher. higher. <laughs>